two were talking so well before and then and then it was like there was like a great little tech talk there and then i was late it's my fault and we ran out of steam now we're sitting there silent everyone gets to listen to us do it it's going to drive jeffrey crazy because i'm going to go back and clip all these bad starts off yeah the tenured professor showed up we all shut up we do have a nice crazy clear edu tag on some of them coming in so we're definitely getting contact for the second hour I was going to just say that I think that the backstory behind Cyberpunk 2077 and the origin of the original game is is as fascinating as the game itself. So look into Mike Pondsmith. He's a really creative guy. It appears everything is running correctly. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Office Hours. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, if you are here in, in YouTube and uh, you would like to actually be part of the conversation, you can see a little link down below and you can join there. Uh, don't ask any questions in YouTube because we, we don't do anything with those chat. Uh, you have to go to Zoom and then in Zoom, you'll find a link to Makana and that's where we do the question and answer and uh, chats. So um, so go ahead and uh, kind of move through that if, you, if you'd like. If, you're, if you see us talking, if you're new here and you see us talking and you think that you have better answers than we do, you might. And we'd love to have you join. So you just need to be here by 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time um, when we do the mic checks. When we do mic checks, once, we, once we've done those, um, it's, uh, we've closed the, the gap. Now, today is the one exception where we uh, will actually open up again at uh, 7.50. Uh, we are going to s- cut the show at 7.50. Not cut it, but we're going to at 7.50, we will stop the general Q&A and give give everybody 10 minutes to come in. I think that there's been kind of leaking into the eight o'clock hour uh, of us starting late. So we're going to, you know, so Q&A will end at 7.50 um, and then we'll go into the, um, give 10 minutes to educators to, to go into the second hour, do their mic checks and so on and so forth. And so if you're wondering what mic checks look like on YouTube, uh, you can see then. So uh, so that, that that's how that'll uh, kind of uh, spin out there. Uh, a, a, qu- a reminder that, you know, we run on questions. Uh, a lot of questions. Uh, we burn through these questions relatively quickly. And, um, and so it's important uh, for, uh, for you to ask them. <laughs> so if you have questions about media production, virtual production, this is the place to ask. It's pretty amazing uh, brain trust here, uh, centuries of, of uh, history of experience doing this. And so uh, it's, it's really a good time for you to ask those questions. We do have a new feature here where you can tag those. Or the, the tagging's working, right? Yeah. So you can, you can have EDU there, but you'll notice that you can actually tag it as EDU, which makes it easier for Bill to do his job. So, um, so you'll see that there's a second hour tag inside of Mukana that Chris just added that's pretty slick. So, um, so that's going to allow us to kind of sort things and, and move faster. But what, what it does allow us to see right now is we don't have enough questions. So, so ask, uh, ask more questions and uh, we'll, 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 we'll get through them. Um, Bill, next question. We're all set with the first question of this morning. Comes from TJ Asher in Minneapolis. Upstream key, downstream key. What's the difference? Why do they exist? And what's the usage for these? So the upstream key is generally more integrated with the program. So it's, it's really upstream of, and what, the, what it is, is it's upstream of the clean feed. So the upstream key is, is part of the program. And it's before, if you do, if you, in a switcher, if you say, I want to have a upstream key, uh, then it means that when I say there's a clean output and a program output out of you, or what we call a clean feed and a dirty feed coming out of a switcher. Um, and the dirty feed has all the graphics, all the upstream, all the downstream, everything. It is the, it's what everybody saw. The clean feed is everything except for the downstream key. And so, um, and so, the, uh, so basically downstream keys are typically used for things like lower thirds, bugs, graphics, those types of things are your downstream keys. And the reason that they're downstream is they tend to be the easier things to process because you're going to keep them in a separate, they're basically being kept in a separate bus I'm simplifying it a little bit, but they're kept in a separate bus in the switcher. If you kept everything in that in separate buses or down there, it would be very comp- computationally expensive for the switcher to keep all of that in. Oh, I'm going to keep all of this as a separate feed. So what what you'll notice is is that the downstream options tend to be the simpler options. You don't get to do super sources or even green screen you know, on a um, you know black magic switcher in an downstream key you're doing that in upstream key because that's integrated into the show um into that so they can keep it all in one bus as far as how it's processing whereas the the downstream key is protected 
so that when you do a clean output, and the reason you do that is so that if you make a mistake, you can fix the lower third. Or if you, uh, sometimes you're sending out like in broadcast, we may be doing a show and we have all of our graphics, but ABC and NBC and CBS don't want those graphics. They don't want our lower thirds. They don't want our bug or our logo. So in, a, in an event, we might send them the clean feed that doesn't have any of our graphics to it, but it has, but we add our, our downstream keys and then send it out to our YouTube stream or, or whatever. So that's a kind of a use case in addition to, we always record a clean feed of our shows as well as a, as, as a program feed so that we can correct issues like misspelled names and so on and so forth. Go ahead, Bill. I'm going to oversimplify and misdescribe it with purpose. And, and so your upstream key is something like your chroma key, where you're going to knock out a green screen and put a background in place there. The, the other key, the downstream key, is going to be something that's going to live on top of or in front of that key usually. So you really kind of have layers when you think about it that way. It's the primary right. and secondary stuff. But again, that is an incredibly oversimplification, but it'll help you understand that that little lower th third is your downstream key. But you really want to think of it as your upstream key is upstream of the clean feed and the downstream key is downstream of the clean feed. I mean, that's really the, the separator of, of how all that works, but that's just a keyer. Uh, that doesn't really, um, it's not exactly what we, anyway, uh, next question. Yeah, moving on to the next question, which comes for us from Angela here in the panel. Angela Iserman of Golden's Bridge, New York, who says, I'm using Discord screen share that's half open all day with my small productions team. One of my MacBook Pros won't share its screen. It tries to connect and then the, says the stream fails. Is there an image I can send in the Discord chat for reference? Oh, there is an image I can send in the Discord chat for reference. You can do that. I, the first place that I would look there is permissions. So you want to go into, did you go into that, into Apple permissions and make sure that you, that uh, Discord has the rights to capture the screen? Yeah, I couldn't find where it was different from my other MacBook Pro that it, that does share the screen. So I, I was trying to And they're both find... on the same OS? Yes. I, I think that it's a setting. It, it's almost always a security setting. Uh, you, you know, in, in um, <clears throat> when you can't see the screen, it's almost always now. What 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 computer allows it, and what computer doesn't? What hardware? Of course, the computer I'm sitting on allows it, but the computer that I'm always working on that you guys see so me what, turn what, to what, is what, what's the model on on each one? Are they both the same model? They're both the same model. I think that we purchased them a year a year apart. Yeah, I think that it's. I think it's in the security settings um, in the screen I'll keep share. Digging. Access to access to capture screen or record screen, I think, is the is the the column, mm -hmm. and without that checked off, um, we have that problem all the time. <laughs> so, so that's a, that's a really that's a really common one that that you have to because once you once they ask for it and you say no by accident, you click on something, you're clicking fast. Now you have to go in manually because it's just decided you're not allowed to do that. You know, you don't, it doesn't keep badgering you about it. It just doesn't do it, uh, and and a lot of these programs don't handle it well. Like for instance, uh, we, we had this problem with Resolve. Resolve will, when you're trying to save out a LUT, if I was hitting too quickly and I said, no, no, you can't have disk access or something in Resolve. So then Resolve goes through the whole, I couldn't figure out why Resolve, it would literally go through all the steps of, of saving out a LUT, but then there's no LUT. It didn't tell me it couldn't save it. It just didn't do it, you know? And so, it's, and, and this is in 16 and 17. And, and so, uh, so that's what happens is, is it doesn't tell you anymore. It just doesn't actually execute it. It makes a call that doesn't go anywhere. So I think that that's, I think that you want to look in your security settings um, in the, in, uh, and I can I'm look at my preferences here to make sure I can be more precise. Um, but the, uh, in security and privacy, um, I believe that that is going to be under um, screen recording. And then there's a list there that will have a list of apps under screen recording. It's the second page or it's the privacy page. So it's, it is uh, privacy and security. I can't show you the screen. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, anyway, so, and then the fourth page over is privacy. And when you go to privacy, you go down to screen recording and in screen recording, you'll see a, um, uh, you'll see a list of apps that have access to it. Is that it? And it was off. There we go. That's the one yeah. that gets you. Yeah, I had a list of everything checked off except for Discord, and yep. I just couldn't find that one one page. I knew it had to be somewhere. I'm glad I saved your time because the first couple times it took me a long time to figure that out. Like, <laughs> like it's you know, it's just that I now I do it like once a week. A new new <laughs> new computer, a new problem. Anyway, okay, great. All right, next question. 
Moving on to Chad LaForge, or LaFarge, excuse me, of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Mickey, on the top of uh, topic of auto levels, how do you feel about Waves Vocal Rider to normalize levels on a stream? <clears throat> uh, on a stream, yeah, I would, I would put that in, but not to do the work for me, but to help, to assist me. So maybe let it go 2 or 3 dB up and 2, two or, or 3 dB down. But just that, that tiny range of adjustment just to help me out. But I won't let it do the f whole job for me because it's, 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 it's using algorithms. It's not, you know, it's not a human ear. And, and that is where for most live events, I find the most power is when a tool gives you enough to do something, but you can kind of override it as a human. So it's doing some of the work for you, but not all the work for you. Handing it off to it is the part that doesn't usually work. Like for instance, a... Uh, cedar, which makes uh, sound uh, noise reduction, kind of like what, well, it's, it's actually the predecessor. Before there was noise assist on, on the Mix Pre, a lot of us used cedar. And they have a really expensive box that's like a DNS or a DNS2. But they have a DNS, and I can't think of the name of it right now, that has sliders on it. And it is, wow, it, so you can sit there and play with how the cedar handles noise. And it is amazing so while there's a lot of auto ones where you can say learn and then it just gets rid of it the it doesn't replace the one with with uh, sliders because you can sit there and play with how it's handling different frequencies and process and and we don't usually need it um that tool is more useful if you were listening to telephone lines and needed to uh, pull a voice out of those telephone lines if you were you know listening to lots of them and needed to clean up the signal a little bit to understand what people are saying those sliders are super useful and that's why they were created i'm pretty sure <laughs> but but the uh, but they're useful also for our shows um as far as doing it it's, we're glad that it's now publicly available instead of privately good uh, bill um just yesterday i happened to be ducking breaths in a recording that i did off of zoom and um i thought does somebody have a deep breather and and waves did so i happened to be on their site and noticed that their sale for the holidays is still on so most of their plugins are down to like um i think it was 29 bucks for things yeah. that were usually 100 bucks so it's a great time of the year to pop in there i want to see if they've gotten breath control under control because they used to be kind of yeah. All of them used to be kind of iffy why yeah. I kept doing manually, but. Uh, next question. Moving on to Dan Huber of Erie, Pennsylvania, who says, what should I get for better control of my audio into Zoom? Loop back, question mark. Uh, I, I kind of, I hemmed and hawed over loop back because I was like, really, do I need to spend that much money on a, a plugin? Now I would say that not only should you get loop back, it's probably audio hijack, the bundle, <laughs> the bundle with audio hijack and loop back. If you're on a Mac and you want, to do basically you want a swiss army knife of i want to route and process audio in my mac to multiple outputs at the same time or to multiple multiple inputs to the same thing and be able to creatively mix them match them i don't know of anything else that's like those pieces of software i mean i don't i don't know if anybody has any disagrees or agree i, mean, I think that how many people have loop back and audio hijack at this point yeah so it's a it, in this group there's a it's pretty deep. Dan, did you have any, any deeper question about that? No, I, you know, yeah. I'm just uh, stepping it up. You know, I got the mic, I got the, yeah. <laughs> you know, the light and I'm going to. Yeah. It's, it's a really, uh, as far as, as far as, you know, processing and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot, I don't process on a daily basis through it. You know, I, I'm, you know, I just, I have a, a good recorder and a good mic, but I don't do a lot of processing, but there are so many places that we use, uh, audio hi that I use audio hijack and loop back in, in pipelines that it's, it's super valuable. Go ahead, TJ. Do we know if there's any windows equivalent to audio hijack or loop back? Well, I think that windows does what loop back does internally. A little, I think a little bit of that's in the OS. So you don't have to do loop back in the same way. It's just not as visual. It's not as you, you know, it's not as good. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mickey. And then Jeffrey. Yeah, on Windows, uh, I've never used it, but uh, I always hear people talk about the voice meter. And there's a version called banana and a version called potato. So, yeah. The, and it's like the, I, I think that like the thing that putting those, those pink mustaches on the front of cars cost lift, I think, billions. You know, just because people like me would, I'm never going to show up anywhere in a car with a pink mustache. In the same way, I don't ever want to tell a client that I'm using, voice meter potato or banana 
And so the thing is, is that like, it, it just, I would change the name. Anyway, Chet Jeffrey. Yeah, I was going to talk about, yeah, Windows uh, does a lot of native input output ingestion. So it really doesn't need loopback as much, but voice meter, uh, banana and potato do work. You want to get a third party program. This one will be a more digestible name called Contabili, which allows you to do bring in all the plugins into your voice meter or whatever program you're using. So you can use Contabili to bring it into your banana or your, or your, or your potato. Bring it in the banana and out the potato through Contabili. Oh, yes. Not good marketing. All right. Next question. Add on plugin called Sprinkles. Um, moving on to Francisco, uh, Francisco Marquez. Manriquez, I'm sorry, um, of Sonoma, California, would you recommend purchasing a new Mac Mini to be used with the Atom Mini Pro? The need would be to use Zoom live stream and creating content and in the market for a computer to be paired to the Mini Pro. So I, I'm, we've now purchased 12 <laughs> Mac Minis. Um, and uh, the M ones and just the eight gig ones, but we're using them for what we're using them for is to manage a zoom connection as well as uh, run a, a 6k a black magic 6k and a mix pre, um, but both through Bluetooth inside of a kit, they sit right underneath the, the camera and, and recorder. And, um, and that has been really successful. That said, I'm not sure that I would jump into it feet first as a general media tool just yet. There's a lot of, uh, tools that haven't been completely updated yet, you know, so I, I as my primary, uh, tool, I would make sure I would really be careful of, of looking at online stuff of, of the tools that you're using and are, have they been updated and are they stable? Uh, I haven't actually run into almost anything that hasn't worked, but I haven't really done exhaustive tests either. So it's a great machine and it runs really fast. And for my, I'm kind of planning the next generation of this little studio, and I'm definitely going to probably end up with four of them in here to, to kind of be the little brains that do all the things, you know, like that, you know, the, the you know, that, that, have all things. Cause I, I want it because I want it to all be screens. And so I just want to be able to route those screens wherever I want and have a keyboard that jumps to whatever it needs to. And so, um, so the Mac minis make a ton of sense in that. I think they're, they're, they're the, one of the most powerful little computers that I've ever seen. Um, anyway, John. No, some of the new Macs have issues with the number of ports they have, so be careful about that. And, that and that's something the Mac Mini to... doesn't have. I mean, I think the Mac Mini has plenty yeah. of ports on the back. It's been we that's haven't really good. had a, a a port issue because we've got two USBs and then we've got two uh, two USB Cs, two USB As. We've got you know it, um, HDMI. We don't feel like we're any less than we had before. So that that's I think that's part of the we're not giving anything up yet, Peter. I was going to say, I'm, I'm using my M1 exactly as you described. It's got the mix pre sitting on top of it, hooked into my, and the, it's talking to the A10 Mini Pro. Uh, it is, I had to do that because it turns out when I put the Quadlink card in the Mac Pro, it broke Zoom. Mm. It sees every possible camera combination. Right. Off yeah. Of oh, yeah, 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 there's that. <laughs> Yeah. And 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 scroll is broken. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, next question comes from John Preto in Las Vegas, and he asks Alex and panel, "What do you believe is the best media playback platform, hardware or software?" I'm testing MIDI Playback Pro, VLC, HyperDeck, and so forth. I'll be playing back directly into Zoom via virtual cam driver or via NDI. Uh. We're testing some of that too. My needs are a little bit different. I have to be able to export. I have to be able to play back PQ, you know, HD, HDR with 16 channels of audio. And, and so I'm trying to get past the HyperDeck. The HyperDeck, uh, for a variety of reasons, became a problem on our end. Um, and so it's too slow, like if I'm doing iterations and, and so on and so forth. And it's a little bit wonky when it comes to lots of channels. Because to get 16 channels, to create a file that, that outputs 16 channels on a HyperDeck, you're basically asking the HyperDeck to do something it wasn't built to do. Like you have to fool it into doing it. And so the settings that we have to use and resolve to get that done is, you just every time you do it, you're like, this is the most absurd thing I've ever done. So um, so we're, we're working on that. The two that I'm looking at the most are Softron. I think it's Replay or Playout. Um, and QLab, you know, like those are the things that I gotta, I gotta test that, that those are the ones I'm kind of leaning towards. Um, I don't think BLC is feature rich enough, um, for what I'm doing and 
MIDI is another possibility, but um, remote control is really important to me too. Like, so the, so I don't know, I haven't, has anyone done the, the part that we haven't, we have it all. It's, it's on my list of things I have to test literally next week. So if you ask me next Saturday, I'll have more, more things because it's what, I, but I am trying to move away from hard. This is a, a long, taking me a long time to get to the point. I'm trying to move away from hardware playback because I'm usually a very religious about hardware playback, but uh, the AJAs are the, the key pros are not something I'm super, super excited about. Um, in the, and then the hyperdex have, because of the 16 channel limit that it doesn't really do 16 channels. You have to force it to has become kind of a uh, problematic situation for me. So I'm looking for software. If anyone ha does, has anyone done like, uh, I don't know if Victor has multi-channel, like 16 channels of output from QLab. Does it do that? Does it care? Yeah, go ahead, Nikki. I've done six on QLab. Uh, five point. I'm sure if it does six, knowing it, I, I'm sure if it does six, it probably does a hundred. <laughs> like yeah. like so, the, if it does more yeah, than no, two. It, no issues at all. Playing playing yeah. out the ProRes four by four with with uh, six channels, uh, yeah. no issues. So that's what I'm. That's what we're kind of um, QLab is because the, the thing I like about QLab is being able to basically remote control it completely. You know, and be able to you know have it be part of a, a larger pipeline. Um, there's some yeah. There's some issues that I have to deal with related to time code that we have to insert time code into it all um that i haven't figured you know i think that i can feed qlab into that but um anyway i'm trying to I'm trying to figure that out yeah go ahead victor uh, there is a really great resource at the qlab site it's like a handbook that has so much information densely parked so i would definitely go there and check it i think they call it the qlab cookbook right. and uh, it's a it's a living document that is amazing great Next question. Uh, comes from Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C., and I believe it's about the yesterday second hour um, about where we dove into Zoom OSC. His question is, I haven't been able to watch yesterday's show yet, but was the key takeaway that NDI is coming to Zoom? Is the NDI coming from Zoom itself or via Zoom OSC? I think, I think a pretty strong rumor, and I think Zoom actually talked about it, is NDI, is coming, NDI availability is coming to Zoom. We just don't know when. And it's, you know, it's, I, I think that that's, I don't, I, I think that someone, someone said that publicly. Um, next question. Uh, it's from Francisco Manrique again from Sonoma, California. How can I start using the meter mic, uh, Mickey's meter here in, in his own meetings? What resources does he need to enable that? Mickey. So yeah, uh, the meter that we're using here is called WLM. It's co from a company called Waves. And uh, to run it, you need a host uh, program, um, some uh, a program that could run VSTs or AX um, or AU plugins, audio plugins. Um, what I'm using now is uh, is um, Audio Hijack, and then I, I'm capturing the window of the meter using OBS and feeding that out to to zoom via the virtual camera. Um, Hasmuk, who's often on the panel, created the nice videos and you can dig it up on uh, Discord. Next question. Moving on, John Pruitt of Huntersville and here in the panel says, I'm considering a new larger 80 inch or so TV next year. What should I look for in it? Well, don't right, take TJ. it apart and look in it, look on it, look at it. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, uh, TJ. Uh, the first thing I would look for is to make sure it has Dolby Vision support yeah. um, at, at, at minimum. And then depending on your uh, area, um, if you have really good light control, then I would recommend looking at an OLED panel if you have the budget for that, um, because you get such good blacks and such good contrast with that type of panel. You just have to be, be careful of how you're using it. The OLED. I, I just I have to say this over and over again because it's like an obsession. We have we have one OLED uh, LG in our in our office, and when we're doing a bunch of our tests, we make sure to turn it off because if we have anything staying there for a long time, we're afraid of, of uh, uh, you know burning it up. So so the uh, so you just have to be careful of you, you you need to have screensavers and you need to have things that aren't gonna you know you can't be playing video that has like let's say a time code on it down at the bottom. Not that I've ever done this to an OLED. But um, I have worked on an event. I didn't do it, but someone did leave the OLED on and uh, they left it on all night and there was time code running in the bottom and that time code now is there forever. So, so the, while some of the numbers are changing, 
not all of them. And there's a big black space and everything else. And so, so it, it, you have to be careful of OLEDs. Um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility and you just have to um, know that you're built, you're buying the best of it, but you have to be careful of that. They tend not to be, I find that they're not quite as bright as some of the other, you know, else some of the other stuff that we've seen, but man, the blacks are just, it's, it's a super rich image. Um, I, I agree with TJ that vision is table stakes. Like I wouldn't buy a, I wouldn't buy a, a, a TV without it. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's the, I think it's going to be the format winner there. I would start to consider at 80 inches at 70 inches. I wouldn't go over 4k cause I don't think it's worth it. Um, at 80 inches and above, I'd start looking at stuff. It gets really expensive, but I'd start thinking about 8k, um, you know, because you'll actually be able to take advantage of it. You know, if you're, if you're close enough, you know, but, um, I mean, I have looked at a lot of stuff and at about um, six feet on an 80 inch, six to eight feet away from the 80 inch, I can, I feel like I can tell the difference between 8K and 4K. You know, like it's, you know, that's the, but, but any further back than that, I can't. So it's, it just depends on where you're putting it. And that's pretty close to an 80 inch TV, but it's a great experience, especially with 714. Uh, anyway, Jeffrey. Yeah, I just mounted a 70 inch TV. And uh, the one thing that uh, if you've got a mount, on whatever TV you've got right now, VESA mount, uh, make sure that it will allow for an 80 inch TV. And if it doesn't, you'll want to get one that's rated for an 80 inch TV or else your TV is going to come fall into the floor. The uh, most, most of the mounts will do well. I mean, you get a good mount, but most of them do, do a pretty good job. GJ. You'd mentioned um, your sitting distance. I think THX, uh, and I can't remember, I'll see if I can find the link to it. They had a, a ratio of how big your screen size to how close you should actually be sitting to your television. And most people actually sit too far away from their TV. Um, they, should, they need to be sitting actually closer than they think. But that goes against what my mom said of don't sit so close to TV or you'll ruin your eyes. I think of it really as my, as my field of view. So I, uh, I have a, I like it to be uh, about, <laughs> this will sound crazy, but when I'm looking at a screen, I want the screen uh, to basically be 80% of my field of view, of my natural field of view. Um, you know, so I don't want it to be 100% because then I feel like I'm missing things and I'll start turning my head. Um, I, I find I, I had this discussion about it because I used to be like, I want it to be the full frame. And then I was talking to a visual effects supervisor uh, named Dennis Murin, and he was like, I, I really like it. To, I like it to be boxed in. So I, try, I tried that out and I was like, okay, Dennis is right. Uh, uh, John and then Sky. Yeah, just to give you a, a, an idea of where I'm working with, it's going to be about 15 feet away or so. It's a fairly large living room space. And uh, it, it, I really don't have a way to move it closer due to the type at, of furniture and layout. At 15 feet, at 15 feet at 80 inches, I wouldn't bother with 8K because you won't, I don't think you'll be able to see the difference yeah. between 8K and 4K um, at, that, at that distance. And, and the other thing is I'm coming from a 720 uh P or 720p uh, TV. And the reason for that, I deliberately chose 720p because I looked at the distance and realized yeah. that I wouldn't do anything better at the distance mm. I was at at my previous TV. But, you know, so I am aware of that at least. Yeah. But I do think the 4K will be fine for you. And, and, uh, but it will be a jump from that to that will be great. Um, uh, Sky I think I'll have to upgrade TV. the Apple TV too. <laughs> well, I would definitely do that. Yeah. I mean, you definitely want the newest Apple TV to take advantage of all the devices, and then, and then, of course, the sound. You know, so the next, your next problem will be, you know, what are you doing with, for speakers? Um, uh, Sky, and then Bill, and then TJ. In a theater, you could barely tell the difference between 2K and 4K. I mean, that that, and I've been in those oh, theaters, and two, I can't. You're the, when you can, well, when you see them next to each other, you can. I. When they did the, when they There's did the, You'll never, they, yeah, go ahead. yeah. So when they did, uh, what got me into Dolby Cinema was when the 20th anniversary of um, Dolby Cinemas, you know, the ones that you go to, the 20th anniversary of the Matrix yeah, came out, go. and they did, we're going to do a 20th anniversary playback of the Matrix on only on Dolby Cinema, and so I went. I was like, I just want to see the Matrix in the theater again. I didn't know anything about a Dolby Cinema, and I. Uh, um, I got into that and there's two things that I, two things that I left with. Number one is, wow, a lot of us did effects at a really low resolution because all the film for the matrix was rescanned for this one at 4k. Yeah. So it was all, all the things, but yeah. every time there was an effect shot, it went back to the fact that for rendering purposes, nobody did anything at 4k back then. I was doing visual effects shots for star Wars and we definitely were not doing 4k. 
Um, and so what happens is it goes really sharp, really soft, really soft, really soft, you know, like, and, and yeah. you can see it in the theater, you know, bouncing back and forth in the, in the matrix when, it, when that happened. And, uh, the other thing I left with is I never want to see another movie, uh, outside of Adobe cinema. Like I haven't, I literally have not gone to another movie theater since I, since 1999, 2019. Yeah. And to that point, IMAX was your concept they were trying to get you your fullest peripheral vision yeah. so you'll go into these larger imax facilities yeah. and they will rake the audience I, in relationship to this to the screen which i vastly prefer the dolby cinema experience over imax at this point you know like i i would rather you know I, I feel like that wraparound drives me a little i found that once i went to dolby cinema so i did go once to imax after that uh, after that dolby cinema and i was like mm, no i don't like that anymore you know and, and so well, it's like was a, that technology what 30 years ago so yeah. dolby has come a long way in that and i guess the other thing i would do would be in a coloring facility often john you will put a light behind your your monitor to give it a, a little bit of a depth for you so there's a yeah. aesthetic there as well good uh, bill and, and, and i and guess the, the T, tj your other point was yes your mom said don't sit so close because at that point we were looking at cathode ray tubes so there were things coming out of that that I don't think the, the current LEDs have the same radiation. I don't know who's well, who smart. Knows. I will I will say that I don't know how much truth there is, but there's a lot of research going on on why warm displays on your phones are super important and why mine's turned all the way up all the time. So uh, Bill and then TJ. Well, I would just that kind of leads into my question, which is with HDR coming in 4,000 nits and God knows how long the spec goes up to 10,000, will TVs start coming with a recommended SPF sunscreen rating well, uh, well, the, that you the, should wear while watching them? The Sony monitor, the Sony monitor that I, I was using last week or two weeks ago literally comes with a warning not to watch it all the time in HDR mode. Like it, it's literally like uh, this could damage your eyes, uh, TJ. The other thing is if you have extreme light control where you can really black out um, your environment, it might be worth taking a look at a projector at this point, because you can get 100, you know, 80 to 100 inch screens that you can motorize it down or up. And from an architectural standpoint, will take up less uh, visual space and you won't have this big black thing in the room when you're not actually watching it. But make sure you get a, a real and good screen. A bed sheet is not a screen. I, I think that it's, I, I think that, uh, I think we're going to be in an interesting time when it comes to home AV and theaters. When we looked at what happened with HBO, you know, last week, you know, with uh, Warner is that I think that we're about to see kind of this sep deep separation in theaters and home theaters, because the, the reality is, I don't know if TJ agrees with me, but as soon as you have a vision capable 70 inch or larger with a seven one surround, that's, that, that's the minimum. Once you get to that, you almost never go to the theater again. Like I don't you know, TJ, is that your, is that your experience? <laughs> yeah. I, I have not been to a movie at a movie theater. Yeah, probably. I think the last movie I thought in the theater was the last star Wars movie yeah. that came out. And the only reason I went to see it there because they didn't want to get spoiled by all the gossip about it. So I just wanted to go see it to to just have it seen right. but already. That was the that was the turnover. Was I'd want to see it before it comes it comes out. When that goes away, it's over. Like it's over for theaters. Like it is like because no one's going to go. The only reason we were going to theaters is so it didn't get spoiled, you know. And and so the thing is is that is that one we don't have to worry about that again. If you have a little TV or a bad audio, you're not you might still want to go to the theater. But once you have again a seven one uh, or better or a and you know I have. In my in my office we have a, a 514 um and in the at home i have a 71 and but once you get used to watching it that way it sounds better and looks better than the theater and most theaters except for the dolby cinemas and the imax you know are the only ones that, and so what i think we're going to see is uh, those kinds of theaters high-tech theaters arc light um dolby cinema uh imax you know that type of thing i don't think that I know that a lot of people talk every time I say this Alamo comes up Alamo the uh, you know their their um, the problem is is that if I want to eat while I'm watching movies I can do that at home you know like you know I you know and so I don't you know I don't and and so um, so the thing is is that I uh, so I think that the, the thing is is we're going to see this huge separation as people get more and more of these home movies inside of COVID and as soon as day and date came out and I think that I will argue the math by the way. 
there's something in Wall Street Journal that underlines stuff that we've talked about internally. The math of streaming, of using it to keep people streaming rather than theater releases is so on the side of streaming that what the reason that Disney wasn't doing this, or not Disney, but but they weren't, um, Warner Brothers wasn't doing this before was not to lose the directors. You know, so COVID gave them the okay, like, hey, we can't keep these in, in, the, in the can forever. We have to release them to go do that without, and, and explain to the directors, like, and the directors are complaining, you know, there's a, Christopher Nolan is very upset, you know, and everyone's up because, because they know what's going to happen. No one's going to want to go to the movies anymore. You know, not, not ever, because I still go to Dolby Cinema, but not very often, you know, and they're going to go only to the highest end theaters and all these multiplexes are, you know, they, they should just close those. They're never going to open again. I mean, never going to, never going to be that successful. They'll open them and try, but they're, I don't think it's going to, they're going to survive. TJ. Well, I think we're going to end up back in, if you think back to uh, say 40 years ago, we used to have one, you know, the movie palace as it were. And, you know, with a massive giant screen, you know, we had a couple of those here in the twin cities where the screens were just enormous and, those eventually went away in favor of the multiplex with crummy little screens, right. crummy sound, but I could, I could roll a lot of movies through that in a short time period. Well, and, and I think that, I think that what, I think what we're more likely to see is the streaming giants, which Amazon's looking at this, Netflix is looking at this. Others are probably looking at this, um, of building their own theaters. So I, I can, I'm going to predict that top 50 markets will have Apple theaters and Netflix theater like owned by them because the, you know, Congress has gotten out of the way, you know, they, Re, they re, they rescinded the laws that kept the movie producers from owning theaters because of the you know this is a um, we have to change the rules because the the market has changed kind of thing and so without those restrictions that way they can have theater releases so if I really want to see an Apple release at an Apple theater or if I really want to see a Netflix release at a Netflix theater um, that those things will will happen and I think that um, you know and then you'll have Dolby Theater, Dolby Cinemas and IMAX but I think that all the multiplexes don't make any sense anymore TJ and then Jeffrey and then we'll move on. Oh, and then Dan. Yeah, that's called the Paramount Decree, uh, which was mm -hmm. just recently overturned. Yeah. And I'm, I'm the t people say, oh, I love going to the movie theater for the experience, blah, blah. I'm the person, I'm at the theater. Be quiet, people. I don't want to hear you talking. I don't want to hear you chewing your popcorn. I, wanna, I want the movie to come to me. I don't want to hear <clears throat> all, the, I, all the other I'm, stuff. I'm one of those people that I think that, that once the movie starts, the doors to the movie theater should only go one way. Like as soon as you leave the theater, you can't come back in. Like, you know, like, like that's, that's how I like that very much. Like you just, this is lock. Like we're all serious here, uh, Jeffrey and then Dan. Yeah. The only thing that I can see uh, uh, a theater being is because last year we went, when we were in South Korea, we went to the, our first 4D theater experience and we, yeah, well, that's where the, the seats start to move mm -hmm. when they missed on the air and stuff like that. So I would guess that something like that would be an experience that uh, something like the, uh, an Apple store, an Apple theater would really want to add into into it. I, I, I doubt it. I, I think that most people don't. I think that what really what what most people want is a really high end AV experience. Maybe the, the rumble seats. I've done the rumble seats. And I'm, if that's what they are, I don't want I, I wouldn't pay for them. You know, like I wouldn't I didn't I, I was like, I'm not. It's more than rumble seats, though. Okay. Well, I know it's more than rumble seats. But I was like, Oh, I don't like this at all. It made, made me very uncomfortable. Uh, Dan, <laughs> Bill. Yeah, they already the knew the theaters already knew even before COVID that they had to do something else. That's why they were doing those. Yeah, live but then it events. just snapped it. Yeah, it yep. just snapped and, it. And uh, yeah, even even those live events, seeing the opera in a theater, you mm -hmm. can do it at home and yeah. do all that the same. And the last thing about the, this was all about TVs at the beginning. Please don't mount your TV above a fireplace. <laughs> uh, I have anyway. Never mind. Uh, 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 Bill. And then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna move on. Sorry, I'm just gonna note too long. that that I want to go quick, and be go. immersed in the movie is one experience. The other end of that is the Rocky Horror Picture Show or other yeah. things that can become communal yeah, no, events absolutely. where everybody interacts. And so I think there's place for both. Yeah, no, I I think the communal thing makes sense. Um, there's yeah. anyway. Yeah, next question. Guy Cochran of Seattle, I'm sorry, Seattle says CES 2021 registration is open now and it's all virtual. How do you think it'll flow? Uh, I think it'll fly like a lead balloon. Like, I don't know why I don't, I, I don't, cause I, I just don't think that they're thinking it out. You know, they, 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 you know, I think you have the problem you really have is event companies trying to figure out how to be an event rather than trying to figure out how to really create a virtual experience. Um, I'd be really interested to see what um, Pepcom does, you know, how they manage that. I, I kept on meaning to contact them, but I've just been too busy figuring out a great way to do that virtually Jeffrey. And then, and then Paul. 
I can talk about the Pepcom thing easily because Pepcom had an event uh, back in October with NA NAB. Basically, what they had was a page. And, and try to go quickly because we're running out of time. Yeah, of course, yeah. everybody asks questions. Basically, they have, they have a page. And in the page, they had all the sponsors. You go to the page. You can uh, All the reporters can get all the document stuff. But you can also, you'd also go into a Zoom room to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I did a couple of videos. That's how I worked. I'm going to try that again since my CES experience was basically going from booth to booth to getting video mm -hmm. reviews. But we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that was the best thing about Pepcom is being able to you take a camera and cover the whole show in in one evening, uh, Paul. Yeah, I, I I'm worried about the these uh, CES and South by Southwest and these events. Having seen a few of the uh, preliminary events leading up to these, I think they need a infusion of people like the of people that are on this panel. Well, I to, think that uh, to to I be do... successful, I'm worried. I'm worried, uh, Alex. I'm not worried. <laughs> like, 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 you know, turn into something else. I think that that the, um, I think that all companies need to be thinking about that kind of virtual ex experience. Um, and, you know, I've, I went from, I keep on going from one busy job to another. But now, uh, I think now by the end of the year, I'll be able to piece a bunch of things back together. But one of the things I think is important is a multicam uh, studio where you can cut to show your product. You know, so there's a multicam studio, you have close-ups, you have wides, you have things that you want to show, you have the ability to telestrate over top of that. And if every company took some of their booth money and spent, you know, my kit, my kit's a little expensive because I go a little overkill, but, but if they spent somewhere between 15 and 20 grand, you know, maybe even 50 grand, you know, on a space, they would end up in a, in a situation where they can very deftly answer questions in a forum like this where they can cut between things and show it. I mean, Guy shows us a lot of that where he's showing things and he's cutting the close-ups and he's cutting the wides and then being able to have discussions. And again, if everybody was doing that, you know, then booths would be actually more interesting. And, and then the other thing you look at is for press, can I send a bunch of uh, loaners or pre-releases out to press and then do that event with them? You know, we've done uh, wine and cheese tasting online uh, for, for high-end parties um, and, uh, and it is so much fun. You sent, we sent everybody the wine, everybody the cheese, you know, and it was from a, you know, from a uh, uh, Marin cheese company or whatever and, and, uh, and someone up in Napa. So we sent it to them and then we're coming into their location, you know, at the winery and at the cheese factory. And, uh, and then people are eating the cheese and they're talking to the people who make it and, and they're having a, an experience. And I was like, this is like, it was really fun, you know, to, to do that. And the only thing that messed it up is we tried to do it as a hybrid. <laughs> so, so we had people in a room as well. And I was like, this, this was, this was useless. So the part, the, the versions of it that we did that we did about a series of these, the versions that we did that was all virtual was amazing. We have 20 people doing wine tastings together and talking and eating cheese. Now we could do that with technology too. And we just want to think about how do we, with press, you know, I'm going to send you a piece of a, a, something and I'll, you know, anyway, so I just think that that would be a, a, a really interesting way to, to get your product out. Sky, real quick, and then we'll move on. We just packed our boxes. We're going to be doing this virtual uh, delivery mm -hmm. this week, and they're all regional to the, yeah. we, we're shipping one box to California. And so we'll report back, but we're hoping <laughs> it's going to be a small, intimate group. But uh, yeah. yeah, the wine and all of the food prep. I mean, all of the food is in there in portions. We're going yeah. to. That's great. Next question. Paul Wallace, often of the panel and today of the panel, I recently switched from TeamViewer to remote PC because of TeamViewer's high cost. What are the pros and cons of remote access apps? Uh, go ahead, John. I think the biggest thing you got to keep in mind is security of the app uh, from my perspective. Uh, I'm not a big fan of TeamViewer because of that. Um, they've had some security, some serious security issues in the past. I've had good luck from a budget perspective with the uh, Chrome plugin for remote desktop. Um, it works very well and seems to be fairly secure. Uh, other things that I've used have been things like uh, uh, VNC over SSH. That also seems to be secure. Haven't used that particular solution, uh, but the ones I've talked about have been reasonably priced. Um, remote PC... If you're talking about the one from Microsoft, that one you have to be careful with because it can have some serious security vulnerabilities. I, and, I don't think it's from Microsoft. It's it's another. another I'd be careful. I just company. be careful. Like yeah. giving people access to your computer is scary. Uh, the Our, uh, 
Uh, I'm going to keep moving because we now got a bunch of questions. We're not going to get it done until at least eight. I, of course, I pushed everybody to ask questions, and now we have a bunch of them. Uh, next question. Uh, Paul Wallace actually has a second one in here. For a media production company doing large Zoom meetings, what team members are required, and what's the realistic target for expenses and income? Uh, it, it really depends on the number of people that are coming in and how you want to manage each person. Um, typically, our base to manage one of these is a some kind of technical director that can be someone cutting a show because we're doing point to points or, or someone still managing how that show is going to look for everyone. We then have a green, someone managing the green room that's, that's going to manage all of the panelists that are, that are coming in. Um, we have a connection person that's just managing connections that that might be the point to point connections uh, or it's the, um, or it's actually just making, you know, running out and handling people that can't get in. Um, and then, uh, for us, because we're doing point to points, we'll have an audio engineer um, that is uh, that is managing the audio. Because we're, if you build anything complex, you don't really need that if you're doing a um, all in Zoom meeting. But if you're doing anything more complex, you need one. And then we have an overall producer um, that that manages those things. Uh, that is just managing client interaction. To the folks that are working, you don't want them talking to the client all the time. You want them working on what they're working on and then, and then someone filtering through that. And then the size of the event might lead us to want a coordinator or two. It just depends on how many, really that comes down to how many panelists and how many attendees are coming and how you're going to manage that, how you're going to manage those. And then if you are going to do lots of breakout rooms, we'll have someone who's managing the breakout rooms. We throw a lot of people at things. I will flat out say we throw people at problems because, um, because having someone managing something in a zone is important. Um, so that they don't get, we don't have what, what happens when things go, when things go right, you can run an entire event with one person. Um, what you risk when things go wrong is a cascading failure. So one thing goes wrong and someone's paying attention to it, not paying attention to something else. And then that, you know, leverage levers over something else. And then you end up with a whole event, you know, un, unwinding um, because, and that's what we call a cascading failure. And, and that's the thing you worry about a lot. And the, the safety, procedures for cascading failures is having people things run up against this person and then it runs up against that person and, and it's not it's not connected to each other um the other thing you have to remember is any the secret sauce to what we do is uh prep you know prepping all the speakers prepping all the participants prepping all you know prep 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 that's what makes zoom rooms work <laughs> you know like it's not everybody's going to show up one minute before and we're going to see how this works it is the speakers have kits. They we spend a half an hour to two hours with each of the speakers, making sure that they're ready to go. The even the participants, we will do what we call a per sane um, uh, processing, which means that we just bring them in as large groups and make sure that they, their their connections work. And they do. You were trying to flatten the curve everywhere around it. Then we open the event a half an hour before the event to make sure that everyone can get in. So those are all things that you you know it's the prep that makes the show work. The prep and then the run of show and really being clear of how you're going to get into it. Rehearsal. It's, it's all those little ball handling skills. It's not, you know, it, but it does require a team and generally a team that's done it before, you know, so uh, it was one of the reasons that I started this early on was because I realized I didn't know webinar very well. And so there's, there's many reasons that I started office hours, but it was one of the things I was like, I got to get comfortable with this product um, because we're getting a lot of requests and uh, I'm pretty comfortable now. And uh, the, next question. And the P&L aspect of the question. Well, I mean, you know, it, it our, our shows typically... The smallest shows we work on typically, I mean, it's, it's hard to t tell it, it. It typically is about starts at about 10 to $15,000 for us to flip a switch on a zoom event. Um, and then those numbers go up into 50 to a hundred thousand dollars, depending on how many days and how complicated and how many people. And, you know, that's the kind of the, the range that, that we work in, unless someone's doing a lot of repeat events that are the same. That's when things make it easier when you're doing bespoke events, things get more expensive because you're doing design and so on and so forth. So, so that's the, um, I mean, I, I don't know what the, uh, you, you know, I think those, it's really hard because I don't, I don't manage any repeat business. <laughs> so, so as soon as someone does something over and over and over again, I, there's other teams that do it and I don't really think about it that much anymore. I only do like, oh, we don't know how to, you know, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. And then I work on it. It's just not a, the repeat stuff isn't usually an efficient use of my time. Um, so it's, uh, I just have to think about the new things. So, so what's a, what's a good profit ratio for an event for you? Uh, it really depends. I mean, it's, it, you know, your profit, I, I'm not going to get into that here. <laughs> Sorry. Like, it's just like, it's not like, that's a really sensitive issue for everybody, uh, you know, so we'll, we'll stay out of that one. Um, next question. 
Francisco Manrique is back with uh, in pre-assigned breakout rooms for Zoom. I've tried pre-assigning them with each participant's email in the Zoom settings before a meeting starts. However, when I start the meeting and launch pre-assigned breakout rooms for participants, uh, it fails. How can I solve this? All right, go ahead, Dan. I would say you didn't uh, require authentication for the meeting, and you can do that in the pre-setting of the meeting. If you have a registration, that's that that works too, you because you have their email address. But if they don't sign into Zoom with that email address, so they click the meeting and it says we require you to sign in, then that'll right. that'll go into the breakout. Right. Uh, next question. Roberto Barrow of uh, Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania says, I hear the panel mention NDI all the time, and I'm not really sure what it is. What does NDI mean? Uh, go ahead, Paul. Uh, NDI, the word stands for Network Device Interface and is developed by New Tech. I think they're a San Antonio company in Texas, if I'm not wrong. And they put out the uh, TriCaster line of products. And uh, it was made available around early 2016. And then the in 2017, the third version of the protocol was released, adding multicast and a, and a high efficiency mode called NDI HX and other features. And a lot of folks use it to move uh, video around <laughs> over a network uh, and with varying levels of success. Um, so, um, but, but it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool interface as far as being able to move video without having to have a lot of BNC and HDMIs and everything else. You can just use your network. It comes with the fact that if you don't do it really carefully, uh, you're going to end up with all kinds of, uh, we, there's a lot of like, well, it works most of the time. <laughs> and so if, if it's okay to work most of the time, then it, it's good. If it's not okay, then it's not as good. Uh, next question. Christian Pelving in Uppsala, Sweden, I believe. Uh, you mentioned before that you can remote into the Logitech Brio camera on your guest computer. How does this work in f and for both Windows and OS X? On either of them, we remote into it through Zoom. Zoom will let you request, if you click on the, you can request um, a uh, camera control if the camera supports it. Um, and then uh, you can just, you can't control the color or the exposure, but you can control the, um, uh, you can control the uh, Zoom and framing for some cameras. And because the Brio is, 4K, 4K, you can cut into it pretty deep and then move move around to reframe um, something there. But that's all under in the Zoom, if in the ellipsis that's right next to someone, you can see request camera control. And from there, they, if they accept, you can start moving their camera around. Um, next question. Rob Duncan in Toronto, Canada. What's a good starting uh, streaming endpoint servers or services for smaller events that can iframe a media player with caption and language selections? Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. I'm trying to. I'm just trying to grok what what the question is. Fa there. Facebook is probably your best bet because uh, it does the instant captioning and it's free. That, but uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one to answer. I mean, there's lots of things that can do it. So you can, um, you're, you know, you that's where things like CloudFront come in as well. I mean, if you're talking about wanting to have your own player, um, you know, so you have Akamai, you have Cloud Player, you have Cl CloudFront, you have um, Livestream. Um, there is, you know, IBM still to some degree makes those things available. Probably the most turnkey, easy to use player system is probably live stream, you know, that will support those things, will support captions. And I don't know if it does languages. Um, Akamai support, I mean, Akamai and the Apple, you know, foundation player will support languages really easily. Um, but, uh, but it's just, but you have to really understand HLS to do that. Um, but um, languaging, by the way, languages is the, multiple languages is hard on a lot of players because it's how do you select them and how does it decide and you know everything else is is the real thing even with youtube you would end up with six different streams going to youtube under a multi-cam setting so that you could have multiple languages and so it was really inefficient to do it that way with hls you can build a manifest that just says i've got one video stream and i've got all these audio streams and the user can simply change what those audio what audio stream they're grabbing onto so it's super powerful it's just that not many people execute it effectively um, next question paul wallace of uh, austin texas and the panel is saying what is a cloud microphone seal one cloud lift or what's the use case and when would you use this uh, go ahead bill 
It's a little amplifier that that when you have a very low output microphone, it'll boost the signal a little bit before it hits the audio chain. It's useful in things like the Shure SM7 that a lot of podcasters use to come out real low and just needs a boost right there. Uh, note that they have a couple of models. It's not just one thing, some that pass Phantom, some that uh, are used in other cases. So know which one you need. I always think, every time I see the SM7, all I can think of is the same capsules in SM58. <laughs> anyway, next question. Uh, Laura Thompson of Beaumont, Texas says, I've had someone recommend to me that I get a 4K monitor and down-res it to 2K due to my vision, but is it worth the money just to down-res it? All right, go ahead, TJ. Uh, it depends on the size of the monitor that Laura's looking at. Um, if she's looking at something like one of these giant 43-inch TVs slash monitors, maybe. Uh, but I wanted to put out a recommendation. LG makes a 32-inch monitor that is not... Uh, it's not 4K, it's uh, 2560 by 1400. And it's really kind of gives you nice big text on a big screen. And they can be had for about $150. So have a look out for those. And the big thing is how it manages, it's not so much scaling down the signal to it to 2K, but, or how does it scale it up or down? It may create a smoother image. So the text might be smoother and easier to read at 4k you know a lot of that's how a lot of apple stuff works where you get it give it a lower resolution but then it's adding um more detail to the to the edges um that make it a little feel more like a piece of paper that you're looking at now, next question moving on to paul prusikowski of gainesville florida any recommendations for dmx controllable lights to use for lighting up guests on stage at dark outdoor evening events the uh since someone else is raising their hand, the the ones that I'm testing right now are the NAN lights, the mix pre six, the mix panel sixties and one fifties. Um, they're DMX. They're not super expensive, and uh, and I can control. Them. <laughs> so uh, so I'm most of my tests are related to those right now. Go ahead, Bill. Outdoor evening events often, and if you got a large area that you're trying to cover, you need some pretty substantial lights. Well, I People think use... this is guests. Lighting up guests. Oh, guests on stage. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. On that, stage that, at a dark the, the outdoor event. not good for that. Yeah. You're talking right. about big, big lights for that. Yeah. You want par cans or other yeah. kind of tree mounted lights that'll have enough throw to bring up an, uh, uh, a stage for an audience. Yeah. Those are, that's a whole different. Uh, yeah. I, I was thinking I, I, I latched onto guests and not outdoor. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so the, um, uh, but yeah, that's probably a whole, different discussion we should probably have in a second hour is yeah that's the theatrical put that, lighting it's put its that into the business. second hour because i'm doing my second hour planning today yeah. so so put that into there that we should bring some folks in i know that we're going to talk about dmx but we should also talk about like larger lighting solutions and so on and so forth uh, next question james babbitt from here in san diego has our last regular question before we get to edu and that is as an alternative to a wall mount for a tv have you used a floor stand which stands does leo laporte use for the tvs that show his hosts Leo has a kind of semi-pro one that it's a, um, I, and I used them for a while too. They, they have four wheels on the bottom and then they have a little tray and then they, they, they have a, a piece that slides kind of up and down. They actually cut those for the show because they, otherwise they go too high and they stick out if you bring the, 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 the TV that low. We had to cut them too. Um, so they're, they're, the, the, the stem is a little long and I'll, I'll try to find out what, the, I can't remember the brand. They're about 350 bucks a piece. Um, three or four hundred dollars a piece to for those ones. Um, the other ones that we like for any height is in events. What's typically used is a is a heavy uh, floor panel that's you know about uh, twenty eight inches wide, and and then it's got two poles that go up, <laughs> and then it has uh, a bar that goes across. That's usually called a, a French cleat, which is a, it's a it goes across and it has a little hook on it. Then you can put the TVs, you can hook them. And the reason we use them is because you can pick up your TV and just go clunk and it just, and then it just stays, you know, there's no screwing. There's, you can, there's a little screw on the bottom that you can use to, to pull it in, but it's a really fast, fast to put up. It's not like the ones that you have at home uh, where it takes forever to put them in. So I think those Chris are, Fritchie just put one behind his shot. He's that, holding. Yeah, exactly. That's another. And what, what are you using there, Chris? What's that one? This is a uh, stand for one of those, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, speaker monitor mounts. Oh yeah. And I just drilled two holes through it and put the uh, wall mount on that. Yep. Yeah. And so that's, you know, and then the, uh, the other thing you want to think about is whether you want to move it around 
move it around while while the TV's on or whether you want to set it up and, and, and have it there. That's the big decision factor there. Um, and they have both have advantages and disadvantages, Bill and then Mickey. If you want to look at some options, there's a catalog that's been around in the industry forever. I'm sure it's virtualized now called Marker Tech. And Marker Tech used to have maybe a dozen of those kind of models that you could look right. through and find less expensive and more expensive ones. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, you can take a look at the uh, office furniture stores. They carry a lot of those because they're commonly found in uh, in offices and also in schools. Um, a popular brand is, uh, I think, Ergotron makes a makes a bunch of them. And depending on how you want to manage it, I will say that if you're ready to spend a little bit more money, a hydraulic lift on it, like a like a there's a motorized hydraulic lift on these things on the back ends, life changing like that's all i gotta say like we built ones that were into boxes so the they were in a box you literally pull off the top and hit a button and it goes it just comes out of the out of the thing and that's how we did our multi views for our our edit bays uh you know mobile edit bays and it's i mean there's so much work that you do that that to put those monitors up to be able to do that um is kind of magical go ahead tj if you're going to diy a solution for yourself just be aware of the center of gravity when that monitor gets up it's right. going to be a lot of weight high and you need to have a stable anchored base below. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, I said we were going to start at 750 and then it stretched down. So we'll, we'll go a little heavy on the other end as well. If you're an educator, please raise your hand. Um, we've got a bunch of uh, folks raising their hand here. So we're going to start. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, between now 805 and 815 to bring the educators in and do mic, te mic checks. Um, so uh, we'll give everybody 10 minutes uh, rather than being in a rush or doing anything really fast. 10 minutes, uh, I think, to add the, add the handful of people that we have here. So, Mickey, do you want to go ahead and take away mic checks? Okie dokie. Uh, hey, guys. Um, yeah, please put your first name, last name, and location. See, now I have Zoom. to interrupt. Now I get to interrupt Mickey on this one, which is Again. this is a great time to ask EDU questions. So, while we're doing the mic checks, there's 10 minutes. We only have a couple questions here. So, it's up to you to, uh, to ask more questions about education. All right. Thanks. All righty. Um, so, yeah, with the check check so we're going to start off with uh roscoe and then move on to laura afterwards got the meter pin so now i got to talk a little bit i'm up about 25 26 oh i'm right around 24 today so i made it yeah um uh, maybe just give us a, a db up tiny nudge up laura and then uh emily afterwards good morning everybody um let's see what we're doing here today see if i can get into my settings I think you're you're right in the ballpark there, oh. Laura. Maybe just give us the a tiny nudge down. Yes, tiny nudge down. Thank you Thank very much, you. Emily, and then the uh, Chris Clark afterwards. Good morning. Sorry about the confusion earlier. I was talking about the golf course, not <laughs> trying to get into Zoom, um, but I didn't clarify that. Uh, and I don't see the meter today. Oh, there it is. Now I see it. Uh, how am I doing? Good. I think you're right there, Emily. Thank right. you. Th thank you very much, Chris. And then Tony afterwards. Good morning from Tempe, Arizona. We had a little rain yesterday, which uh, closed some operations that normally would be open and uh, made everybody happy. How's that? How, uh, looks like I'm hot. Is that right, Mickey? Yeah, you're coming in about three or four dB too hot. I get too excited when we talk about rain in Tempe, Arizona. So, uh, I might have been uh, affecting that by my enthusiasm, but looks like uh, I'm just, closer yeah. now. Yeah, maybe just the tiniest, tiniest nudge back up, and you should be right there. Tony Thank you. and then Bruce Francis. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, Office Hours family. Good to be here. Nice, shiny day to here in metropolitan Atlanta. I hope everyone is doing well. Hey, Tony. Um, so on your, are you still going through your ATEM? Your ATEM yes. mini? Yes. Um, on your ATEM, give us two clicks down on the volume and give us a quick recheck. Okay. And so that's two clicks down. And I'm not sure. I'm looking at the meter and it looks like it's around 24, 23. 26. Yeah, I think you're you're bouncing around the, the area there. All right. Thank you, Mickey. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Bruce and then uh, Kara afterwards. Okay. Uh, this is Bruce Francis from Naples. I am trying out my new MacBook Air M1 
I'm just using that as a system. I'm not sure how that looks like. I'm 22, 23, 21. Does that sound okay from there? Uh, yeah, give us two or three dB down, um, Bruce. dB down. Okay, let's see. I've got to figure out how to do that. Um, I think that you just... I don't know how to adjust this as well as I should. Look, okay, let's see. So if yeah, if you go to, to Zoom, uh, the Zoom menu at the top, go to preferences and then uh, make sure like under the microphone there's a checkbox that says automatically adjust microphone volume make sure that is unchecked unchecked okay there we yeah. go now i can now i can move it down so yeah. let's see there i've got it down a little bit better does that sound better now as i said one I'm more one more tiny nudge down Okay, I'm trying out this new system, which I love, my new MacBook Air. Tony, I really do like it. It's great. I'm enjoying it, but I have to learn how to use it. So hopefully this is helping. And yeah, are we, I think, are we I close think you're right about, I think okay. you're right about there. Um, Thanks very although, much. Um, I'm not sure if, if there's like, if you're getting glare on your camera or maybe oh, there's a... I think it's the lighting in my room. It's all messed up. I'm, I'm sitting in my easy chair rather than sitting at my desk. So I'll kind of get myself moved around a little differently to see if I can get some light. But this is a complete experiment for me today and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, we'll it's, it's, not, it's not a big folks, deal. It's you just, might, uh, not, most not, might not be enjoying it, but I am. So <laughs> Yeah, it's not, it's not a big deal. Playing. Maybe if you could get uh, some of the light uh, shining right directly into the camera um, out. Uh, with maybe finding your position. I will try um, to but do yeah. that, see if I can get something better that way. All right. Um, but yeah, we'll move on to Kara. Hi. Uh, so uh, Paul has me off of mute. I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. Uh, we did a lot of audio work last week after hours. So thank you for everyone um, who, who participated and helped us. We were doing some troubleshooting with two different mics in the same room. Um, is that good, everybody? And Paul, can you see? Yeah, maybe maybe just a, a dB or two back down. Yeah, because of course, when I get excited, then I'm going to talk louder. <laughs> All right. So, is that good? Okay. Yeah, if you could uh, continue speaking, because it's coming sure. in a, a little hot still. Sure, yeah. So we, uh, we're having a kind of a gloomy day here in Florida. Um, but not too bad. It probably will rain and then the temperature will drop again, which is nice because it'll give us some cooler weather. All right. Um, tiny, uh, Paul, tiny, tiny nudge back up. And then um, I don't know if there might be a uh, another open channel on the mixer because I'm, he I'm hearing some electronic uh, noise. So I don't know, maybe that, that could possibly an open be an open channel with no mic plugged into it. Oh, okay. Okay, Paul, can you check that? Oh. Yep, he said you were correct and that he's got it now. Is that better? Do you still hear it? Uh, hearing, still hearing a, a bit of it, but yeah, it's it's not a huge thing. Um, okay. But yeah, level wise, maybe another tiny nudge back down, and you should be right there. Thanks, okay. Cara. Thank you. Is everybody officially checked now? Wow, that was uh, fast, yeah. Mickey. Good job. Hey, go ahead, John. John. I'd like to try a different mic for a second, Mickey. Uh, go ahead, Paul Wallace. No, just kidding. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, how's this one? Compared to I what the you... joke, Mickey, sorry. I'm sorry. This is a test. I said, I just got the joke. Go ahead, go Paul Wallace. Okay, so I'm at 22, 23, 24. How's it sound compared to my other one? The previous one sounded way better. I think this one is doing a lot of maybe noise suppression. And it sounds uh, it, it's a bit It's that auto noise canceling one. I'll switch back. Yeah, it, it sounds a bit uh, un unnatural on your voice. Okay, well, I need to be as natural as I can. All righty, cool. Thanks, guys. Did you mention me because I'm the gold standard now, Mickey? Oh, for sure, Paul. <laughs> for sure.
when it comes to mic checks? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Where where's uh, Chris uh, when we need him? I'm going to I'm going to break the wall of silence and tell you that there is a question coming up that I have not moved into the regular queue later but it it's a really cool question I want people to think about it between now and then. We have a lot of educators here and we've always said that educators uh, don't have a lot to spend on things. So somebody asked about gift ideas to make streaming life easier for teachers and people without a lot of money to spend. So give some thought to that. We won't go to it immediately. I'm going to hold the question for a little bit, but think about what you might like at a reasonable price point as a teacher, at a boy or at a girl. The teacher should tell us what they want. What yes. people get them? What, what we, need, we need their wish list. We need, the we need the teachers to give us their wish list of what they, uh, what they, what they want there. So think about that as a teacher. Um, okay, I think we're good. Everyone got done much faster than I expected. Go ahead, Chris, real quick before we get to the Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, I got those three mic sets uh, that Colin had put together a long mm -hmm. time ago. I'm not going to use them. So if you can figure out a way to give them to somebody or you know somebody who needs them, I'll send them to you. Awesome, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Okay, we're going to the first one today, and that is James Babbitt asks, could educators in a classroom on Zoom use the Mukana system for handling questions? Another person could organize the questions for the teacher during the class. I think, whoop, Emily said something. Or, or, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think all the hardest I, go all ahead, go I said was that you, if we had another teacher or someone that could organize for us, because that's that's the real big shortfall right now is that we a lot of the teachers are having to do it all themselves without so, a teaching assistant or someone else in the building. Not to that. not to not to beat a dead horse, but if do you think it would be easier for a te for one teacher to manage each class or for three teachers to gang up their classes together so that they could share resources between each other to teach those, the students where they could do breakout rooms and deal with the students individually. And then, but in the general course, be able to, you know, cover the, cover the same amount of information together and then have those still those individual teachers breaking out and talking to the students individually. Go ahead, uh, Chris. There's another opportunity to contact your nearest uh, teacher education program and see whether they have an opportunity for their college students who are preparing to become teachers to, to zoom in and be technical assistance mm -hmm. to uh, certified teachers right. in managing uh, keeping the balls in the air. Cause I, I mean, again, as, as someone who has, we've got a small little army that manages office hours, <laughs> you know, like I, I, go, I, I'm like, I don't know how teachers could actually, I don't know how I, I would lose my mind, you know, like, like, you know, and, and to, to try to do that, to do, try to do, I wouldn't do office hours wouldn't exist without the support that we have here without Mickey doing what he's doing and Bill doing what he's doing and Phil and Chris and, and all these, you know, I have this little, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and without the panelists actually answering most of the questions for us uh, without all of those things, I don't think I would be, I'd be like, Oh, this is too hard. You know, like this is, you know, I, I can't, I can't do this. So I have a lot of, I really understand that. And so I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how would you get shared resources to make each one better? Uh, Emily. Well, I was going to say that um, at the elementary level, that's much easier because you can take a grade level and you might have three to five teachers that teach one grade level. And so them pulling all the kids into one room and then splitting them out into breakout rooms and managing it that way. Yeah, that definitely would work. When you get to middle school, high school, where the kids are switching classes and the schedules don't line up um, and you have some kids in person and some kids remote, then you get into this whole like schedules don't align and things don't work out. Um, could they plan it better? Maybe. Uh, but you know, if all the chemistry classes are happening, you know, fifth period, um, then a kid who's taking AP history that also meets at fifth period can't then take chemistry. And then it, it gets really, that's why there's like five teachers that teach different subjects is so they can rearrange the kids' schedules to meet everyone in the need. You're muted, Mike. Uh, sorry, Alan. Laura. I have spent a lot of time thinking about Alex's um, model for 
larger classes. And I really believe that if it's done right and it's actually implemented correctly, we could change it so that all chemistry classes meet first period, all math classes meet second period, you know, and we could just structure our day that way but it's a new way of thinking about it. And you've got to get people on board to think about it that way. I mean, it took and, me a while. And I will, uh, I will admit that the model that I have in my head is very hard to implement on a local platform. So on a, within one school, it would be almost impossible because you don't have enough students. Uh, what it, the idea that I have is mostly something that you'd have to nationalize it where you have an enormous number of students that are able to, that are available at different times. And you're, you're, you're actually more, more students are easier to manage than, than less in this case, because you'd have um, enough in that group to f reach critical mass. Um, but, but I, I do think that, um, I mean, we have a, it, it's not a matter of that everyone, well, anyway, we'll, we'll go on. Next question. Um, this has EDU on it, but I think it seems familiar. I'm looking to live stream to YouTube using my ATEM Mini Pro. I've not done this before. Any tips or advice? The audience will be high school students tuning in. Can I use the pre-recorded videos in the live stream? And this is from Francisco Manrique of Sonoma. Um, yeah, the first, the first tip is practice. <laughs> so, so, you know, like, the, the, like do it a bunch of times. Just, just do it like... When I do streams, uh, a stream that you see me do that's high profile, I probably have rehearsed 30 or 40 times, you know, like to, you know, and then low profile five or 10 times, you know, like to the whole, and it's not so much the whole thing, but the start sequence, that's what really gets into it. The start sequence. And then what we call a cue to cue. So a cue to cue, um, rehearsal, just so you kind of, uh, is for, is a, what is every cue that we have to do? We're not trying to do the whole thing. We play video. We play the first 15 seconds. And then we go to the next video. We play the next 15 seconds. We, we, then we have someone talk, talk for a minute. Then we go to a slide. And, and so the thing is, is a cue to cue is just going from cue to cue to cue to cue to cue to make sure that everything makes sense, you know, and everything's kind of working. If you're going to do a playback, practice that playback. If you're going to jump out of this. And what you start to learn is that getting from here to here is a little harder. So let's practice that a couple of times to make sure that we get that. It, but this is easy, you know, like going from a playback back to the person, but how am I going to talk to that person and tell them that they were coming back to them? And those are the kind of things you want to kind of try to think out um, as you, as you do those. Um, but congratulations though. I think that that's going to be a great project to go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah. The one thing is the ATEM mini lends itself to external devices playback. It, it really yeah. wants you to have an, a, a, a separate computer. Uh, it's something with an HDMI out, obviously uh, that carries audio, but uh, think about that because a lot of times you're thinking you're going to just take that HDMI off of your laptop or your computer to use it. No, look for that second device. And, and I think that, um, I think I haven't tried it with your iPad. It works great. You can do play out from your iPad from keynote. Um, and, but I think you can do it with your phone and I haven't tried the, the phone to do that um, for play out. You can, yeah, John. So you can you literally use an iPhone to play out the video uh, through Keynote uh, to to do those playouts. Um, so I really wish. Now that I said that, I, I I'm like, why isn't there an iPhone app that just is just a playout system? Go ahead, uh, guy. Yeah, I like this app called um, Live Stream Touch Director for the iPad. I'll cut to it because when you're using the A10 Mini Pro, you can really get into some deep stuff with the XML. So if you can just put in your, your information uh, very easily, it just makes setting up so much faster and takes the headache out of it. So if you're going to be doing this, Francisco, for the first time, I'd, I'd suggest getting that app and it just makes life easier. And then you can also use the iPad for a, a playout system as well. But uh, those are two tips. Is but would you do it at, would you do it? Would you do both at the same time? I would not on the same device. Yeah. It just depends on what the playout is though. If it's just a 30 second or something like that, uh, a lot of the times I'll take, uh, there's another app that you, I can't remember the name of it, but it'll play at full screen. Uh, if it's YouTube, you can get it to play full screen. Otherwise you get these bars on the side, which um, I do think you that can probably you get away Mac, with it at the high school. Also, if you have a Mac, uh, I think the QLab, the free version of QLab would do the basic playout, right? And, and you could then start building cues. I mean, I don't want to make it more complicated than it has to be. You can just hit play and <laughs> go to it. But there's a lot of um, detailed things that you can do. Go ahead, Sky. Guy, you hardwire in from the uh, iPad. That's the. Oh, oh yeah. What? I do that all the time. 
Like my favorite way to use an ATEM mini USB, is to, US, USB or USB C. It's the it's the it's the U, U, USB C to HDMI cable is what you need. And as soon as you have that, it's a, and it just and it just plugs right in. The iPad knows that it's plugged into an external device. Gives you sixteen by nine. I do my keynotes that way all the time because when you do a keynote, by the way, you can draw on it <laughs> because because uh, keynote already has the drawing ability, so you can show slides and draw on them. And what I do is I actually have uh, for my whiteboard. I just have a whole bunch of, like a, a lot of times I don't have a, a slides. I just have a whiteboard that I want to have there. And so I, I use the iPad as a whiteboard. I build 40 slides, you know, 40 different slides with the iPad uh, that are just new whiteboards. And so then I sit there and draw on it and I go, and I just do, do the next one, you know, because it's easier than delete, trying to go backwards or, or, or clearing. The clearing on it doesn't work very well. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, that's a great tip. I've, I've used that. Uh, the program uh, for the uh, iPad is the iMix 16 Pro. That's a that's a great little app that you can uh, get. Uh, Does it play in. out? Yeah. No, iMix 16 Pro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'm Take a look at that. Check that out. Uh, go ahead, Tony, and then Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, when you're using the iPad adapter with the HDMI, you want to make sure that you use the Apple Apple version of it or the certified version of it because I've used several of the uh, third party and they don't work or they'll work for a while and then they'll go out. So you definitely want to use Apple brand or Apple certified adapters for the uh, lightning, and, I'm sorry, the USB-C and the uh, HDMI. I go ahead, Bill. So a little outside the box, but VJ programs, and I think there are some for iOS, that's what they do. They queue one video and let you switch to it as needed. And they often have management and able let you move around the videos. So it might be a category to take a look at on the iTunes store and something like that. Yep. Next question. Moving on to Christian Pelving of Uppsala. Uh, sometimes we can see that students' learners don't read even shorter texts in the course of e-learning. We use more and more videos, uh, text, animations, sound clips, or imagery to help overcome this. Have you seen the same, and have you any solutions on how to get the learner to not skim through texts? <laughs> Alex has his I, hand up. <laughs> I'm only going to say, I'm a skimmer. Like, like not only am I a skimmer, I have been a skimmer since I was a little kid. Like, like I don't, it's, it, it's not like I learned it somewhere. I can't read very well. So I don't read very, I, so the, the fun, the fundamental thing is I'm horribly dyslexic and, and how it was diagnosed when I was having trouble in high school back then, I don't know, 30 years ago was that my eyes vi see, or my brain processes the white space equal to the black space. So that's the, so the, the challenge that I have is that, that when I look at a page, I see all the patterns in the page. Now it turns out it makes me really good at layout, which is why I, I got really good at print layout <laughs> is because any little, if anyone who's worked with me knows any weird, and if you have any incongruity of your white space, I will see it, you know, like, because my brain sees it equally to all the, I don't look at just the subject matter. I look at the whole context. My brain just manages it that way. Anyway, so I skim everything and I have to admit that I'm really good at participating in class because I, I didn't read anything. <laughs> I, didn't read it. I didn't read anything ever. Like in, in school, I, I read every third page of my, of my English assignments and the cliff notes because that gave me enough detail to, to, to answer the questions. And I'm only saying that as a student like that had a lot of trouble, like math and all those other things I did really well in English. I just, I, I still got A's, but I literally just built systems to get A's. Like I didn't care about the, the subject at all because it was, it was literally traumatic for me. English, English class was a traumatic experience because it was just like just scraping me along the, the asphalt. And so uh, just as a, as a student that was there, that's the thing to think about is that maybe text isn't good for everybody. Um, Emily and then Cara and then Laura. So um, yes, I've noticed it. Uh, do a lot of e-courses online and, and the kids, like when you look at the questions they got wrong, you're just like, how did you get that wrong? Like you have the right. passage right there and you got that wrong. Um, but the good news is there are a lot of softwares that support kids, especially like what you were talking about um, with your experience. I had a similar 
learning disability as I was growing up where my brain sees the beginning and the end of a word and then assumes the word. And mm -hmm. so I read really fast, but at the same time, sometimes it comes out like, wait, and then I have to go back and reread it to, to really understand what was said. Anyhow, Microsoft has immersive reader built into their program. So if the students pull in, um, or use the immersive reader tool, they can listen to it faster. They can change the contrast. They can, it highlights the words. And if they're a uh, English language learner, it will also translate the entire page, use a picture dictionary, or the students can individually select words and have them um, defined for them and pronounced for them in their native language, as well as their, um, in, in English. Um, but the newest tools that, teachers are really embracing is um, for videos, things that let you embed questions throughout the video to make sure that the students understood what was said in the first you know, minute and a half to whatever at the video. And that would be things like Edpuzzle, Play Posit. And again, Microsoft Soft just introduced um, in stream, if you have your own stream video. So a lot of teachers in my district are using stream to record lessons for the students. Now you can embed a Microsoft form into the video and get that data as the kids watch the video. So you can see, did they understand what I said in the first half, what I explained in the first half. Um, but those tools to be able to speed it up, slow it down, skip around, um, the students are using that too. And a lot of kids will skim a video um, so they won't even watch the whole video. They'll jump through it. And I won't, I won't go to a site anymore that doesn't let me play it at least 1.5 X. Yeah. Like I won't, I won't even go like I, I, you know, I just won't, won't watch it. I installed, there's a Chrome uh, tab. There's a Chrome uh, extension that, wa that lets you accelerate any video on any website. And it's like the first thing that I install when I get a new computer is I put the extension on so that I can speed everybody's videos up because I can't, I can't understand. Like here's the problem with me is because I'm also very ADD. Uh, I will think of three new thoughts between everything that you're saying if you don't push it together. You know, like, like so, so I need it to go faster because, I, because, I, I, need it to, because I have to saturate my brain or I can't understand what you're saying because you'll say something and then I'll think of like eight other things that are related to that subject matter um, and I'll miss the next two paragraphs. And so it's really important to pull it together. And so to, to your point though, Emily, that it's how, uh, yeah, uh, Cara? Oh, I was just going to uh, recommend to Christian that, you know, when you're asking a learner to read, that you don't overwhelm them with other things on the screen as well. So mm -hmm. if they're supposed to be reading and you have, let's say you do have voiceover with it, the voiceover has to match exactly the text. Otherwise, people's brains will start to troubleshoot, like what's going on, which one am I supposed to be listening or reading? And, and, and we're trying to multitask when you're asking the brain to multitask, like, if you have an image on the screen that doesn't have anything to do with the, um, the text that's on the screen, people's brains will start trying to figure out what the connection is. So yeah, you, as much great. as like, I love the idea of having more, you know, visual appealing things. If you really want them to read, you have to try to minimize the rest of the chaos that's going on on the screen mm -hmm. with e-learning. Good, Laura. Okay. Um, number one, Alex, you make an amazing JAWS user. If you've ever listened to somebody that uses JAWS, use the computer. That computer is talking at a mile a minute. Um, number two, there is a, it's premierliteracy.com. There is a suite that they make. I personally prefer PDF Equalizer. You put the books into the PDF Equalizer. It tra You can trail it word by word. You can make your notes right there. Um, amazing low cost accessibility suite for print disabilities, all print disabilities, not just visual disabilities. Um, $199, 16 apps, one time buy, not a subscription. Now the, uh, I don't know if I should say this or I get myself in trouble, but uh, I have not read a complete book with my eyes since 1986. Mm -hmm. Like just to kind of like, like to kind of put it like it, and and that's when I discovered books on tape. <laughs> so so the the thing is is that uh, that there were books on tape, and I could put tape tape cassettes into a, my my Sony Walkman and listen to the books. I I literally just went, you know, and and now while I'm walking, while I'm doing something, I can absorb that book, and I don't have to monotask, which I hate. Um, anyway, so the um, the I mean, I'm monotask for acquisition. Anyway, so the the I think that one of the things we want to think about and why we do this as a 
video and audio thing is because I do think that people want to hear it and listen to it. I don't think that if we had two hours of content a day that, that was in text, no one would no, no one here would absorb it. And I think we just want to think about that. Um, and I think about it a lot, and we've talked about this before, of video for showing things, audio for a contextual, like think about these things, text for reference, you know, um, you know, and, you know, interactive to figure out if you have it. But I, I think of it in very different pieces and you have to have all of them, uh, in my opinion, uh, for the next generation of education, uh, Lara and then Paul. One other thing PDF Equalizer will do is it will let you condense. It will actually go through and mm -hmm. automatically pull out the main points of every paragraph and put that into a separate document for you. And, and, and I guess the one thing I, I, the one thing I also wanted to say is my wife, you know, has a master's, master's in technology and education from Harvard. Like she's the complete opposite. And we always joke that, that the problem with the heart, not the chat, the challenge with education is that everyone running it was good at it, you know, and, and that, and that a lot, most people who succeed and are in education, Emily is a, a, an exception to that as far as she was, she had issues in the beginning and still became in the education. But I think an enormous number of teachers are really good at reading. Every teacher that I know is tends to me. My wife, my wife reads, reads three or f three to five books a week. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, and, and so she just, you know, and, and that's in her spare time, you know? And so, uh, so I think that that as a challenge is for teachers to understand the students that are having trouble, you know, doing that, uh, Sky and then we'll Paul. Sorry, I, I just, reversed. Alex, your candor and your, your, your system that you created here of trust, you have, ex this last 10 minutes has explained so much about me that I didn't know. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I, I just, there's a calm in me now that I'm, I'm such a sponge, but I have not had the opportunity of being tested. I have always struggled. Reading has never been easy. So that, that A, Alex, that you're being so, so generous with your soul, with yourself, and that these, this, this uh, level of trust that you've established here, uh, again, I'm thankful. Well, and I mean, the reason that I think that the thing that I'm always trying to close the gap of, and I've said this before, is that there's nothing I like better than learning. And, uh, and I hated school, like hated it, you know, and so how do we close that gap? Because if someone loves learning and hates school, we need to figure out how to close that for, uh, you know, for, you know, of, of fixing that problem, um, Paul, and then John, and then Tony. Yeah, and Alex, you said you hadn't read a book for decades whole book. or more. I, I read pieces of them. <laughs> I have, but that said, I have a stat. I have 200 books in Kindle. I have 150 books in, and I read pieces of them as I need them. So I don't read, I don't read, I don't read books to absorb random information. I, I only use books to solve the problem that I have at hand. So I, I'll read little chunks of them. I'm trying to figure something out and I'll read a chunk of that as I need it. It's also how I generate con my, when I do training, it's how I do the training is that I want to push the students to be insufficient where they're clear they're insufficient. And then I give them fuel to be sufficient. But that's how everything I do around education is, is having people get clear of where they're insufficient and then giving them the thing. Then they eat it. They just chew it up and they don't have, you don't have to test them because they, they, they know, they know why they need it. <laughs> and as soon as they get it, they, it becomes permanent for them because it was part of a, it was a, it was an open wound. You just want to create those open wounds and then here, here's how to fix that. So anyway, sometimes, a, sometimes a book comes along that's so good that you that you I listen to the audio version and I read it that's this Matthew McConaughey book it's just yeah. extraordinary and he he has illustrations in it uh -huh. you know uh I, that make I open books I open books and I go wait that's way too much text for me I, I, uh, I just can't get enough of it and I listen I just, to all the podcasts around it too because right. he's been on yeah. Oprah and so that's many great. shows you know it's just yeah. a multi-dimensional experience of print yep. and audio you know it's just an it's called yeah. green lights this yep. this experience yep. with you is a green light by the way thanks thanks john and then tony i just have following up with sky is uh, i was a uh, studied as a certified dyslexic you know and i think it's important for people like us who have had challenges in learning to be very public about it. At my university, I had a very close working relationship with our student services and they would send students over who were dyslexic and have told they really can't get anywhere. And they say, here's this guy who's a professor and a PhD. Um, it, I was at Northwestern. I was studied by the Institute of Language Disorders when I was 20 and they couldn't figure out what was quote wrong with me. But um, I spelled at the third grade level and if you do that throughout school, you get punished a lot. I had a teacher 
who took off one point for every misspelled word with short question answers. So I would have negative 400, 500 because I would misspell more words in my answer than the question was worth, but she still took off one point for every misspelled word. That's where I write very concisely. I don't speak <laughs> concisely, but I write you'll very notice concisely. That a lot of people, like you'll notice that with email, if, if everyone emails me, you'll notice that my emails are really short. It's because it takes so many rereads for me to get it out that I don't, if I send a long email, you know that that took a long time for me to write. So, you, you know, like if it's, if it's more than six lines for me, it means that that took an hour for me to create, you know, it's not like something, a missive that I decided to write if it, if it, you know, cause it's, so I don't, you don't see that very often, but if it does, if you get a long email from me, then you should probably read it. Cause I, it meant I thought about it a lot and it was really important uh, to me anyway, uh, Tony and then Emily and then Chris. Yeah. I just wanted to share that. Um, um, I, I grew up in a, I'm going to say a broken educational system. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about the city or that I grew up in or any of that. It wasn't Atlanta. I'll, I'll say that uh, the system system was broken. And the thing that I think kind of helped me was that my mother sacrificed and put me in a, a private school and she wasn't able to, to really afford to do that, but she did it. And I I'm saying that uh, I know that a lot of people don't have that opportunity, but what I wanted to say about the private school was that it was both academic and project-based. And that made a difference for me because like you, Alex, I wasn't really particularly interested in the nuts and bolts of the math and the language and, and all of those things that, you know, typical education pushes. But in order to do the projects, you had to do well in the academics. And so we had uh, the schools broken up into three uh, primary uh, educational groups uh, or quarters, and so um, a thirds. So the the last third, which was particularly in the spring, was project based. And so we did everything. So I grew up in the seventies, and so uh, one summer we did um, bicent by bi bicentennial. That tells you how old I am. Bicentennial debates. I'm not going to go on, but there were different projects. So one project, one uh, semester, I learned photography, worked in the dark room, developed my own pictures. We took pictures. And another time we did bicentennial, bicentennial debates, we went bike riding through all of the, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, all of the revolutionary sites. And so there were a lot of different projects like that. And I, and I said all that to say that I think that if education is able to bring in some more of the project-based activities that used to go on because, you know, shop and, and auto mechanic and all those things have basically been pushed out. Which and is, so if you, I, if, you, if you can bring in some more of those things that – you know, live streaming, video I mean, uh, creation, those kinds of things can be beneficial. I, 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 I agree with you. And I, the thing that I think somewhere along these Saturdays has really tickled my brain that I'm, that is now becoming like this, like, it's like a little seed that is kind of growing. <laughs> like, this is the problem with my brain is it, it gets a little seed and then it starts growing and it starts taking over everything I'm thinking about. And so it's not there yet, but it's getting there is I had this idea about education and online education and all those things. You guys have all heard that. But the thing that is new for me is really thinking about the, I, the concept. And I don't have the answers yet. This is like brand new in my head in the last couple of weeks that I brought up a couple of weeks ago. The concept that all education is around creation. And what I mean by that is all education, what if you built an entire curriculum around you have to build things and you just learn all the other stuff along the way? You know, like so, and that, that may be, you might have to build presentations and videos and, and things like that. You might have to, you know, um, cooking is a great way to teach chemistry, you know, like, you know, and um, music is a great way to teach math, you know, and, and so there's lots of, you know, looking at those patterns and, and looking at where the, what if students were only doing that? And then the, the learning the other bits and pieces were just along the way. Now, how do you test for that? I don't, I don't know. And I don't really care. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a big, 
fam. The, the R- R- Rwandan Ministry of Education can tell you how crazy it makes them that I won't do tests. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, uh, so but but I think that uh, uh, but I think that there is something there. And again, I think the thing that we keep on talking about, like, do they do they understand it or whatever? Everybody knows what they understood if they needed it, but if they didn't need it, and we 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 try to pre pre train them for things that they're going to need, it's a really inefficient. It's extremely lossy way to educate is to give people information before they actually need that information, and that's why I have a huge number of books that I go to. I have a huge virtual library on my iPad of every manual for every piece of equipment that I use, along with all the theory around all those things so that when I'm sitting on site and I've got 20 minutes and I can't quite figure something out, I can open it up and I look at it. Now I'm ready for that. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry for that. And I'll, and I'll remember it forever. Once I see it, go ahead, Emily. And then uh, Chris. I was going to say, I came to education late. I wasn't until my thirties till I got my teaching certificate um, credentials. And one of the things that drove me nuts when I got into the classroom was uh, sitting in faculty meetings, listening to teachers talk about taking off a point for every misspelled word and hitting like a certain maximum and things like this, like, you know, the, well, they'll never learn blah, blah, blah. And I kept going, but you have spell check. Like, you know, this was like 13 years ago, but still like, it, like, why do you need to know? I mean, basic understanding of how a word sort of works. Um, but like, you really don't, you can talk to text now to your paper. So how do you test kids and and figure out what they know? So I taught high school English. My kids would do, they, they wrote a paper a year, like, cause I was required to give a research paper every year by my department, but almost every other assignment was open to interpretation for the students to show me through whatever means they were better at. So if they could make me a video, a PSA, I had kids make me PSAs on different topics and, and use like a book we were reading and create something out of that, or they would make a diorama or they would, you know, write a rap song. I had one kid create an entire dance thing um, for Romeo and Juliet. And it's just like those kind of like, show me what you know and what you understand can be interpreted in lots of different ways. And um, I feel like, I got into education to make those changes. And it is a really tough uphill battle because when you talk to those teachers that take a point for every little thing and you ask them why they can't justify it, they can just, they need to, but why, why do they need to? And they can't, they can't justify it. And here's the hard truth Uh, for anybody not going to academia, government or science. You, they will not, the 99% of that entire population will never write more than two pages straight for the rest of their lives. Like that is the, like, that's the thing we just need to make sure we're all clear of. Like if they're not in one of those three areas, I work in companies all over the world. I work with groups all over the world. And only, those are the only three places that I see text, you know, lots of it. It's because those people are good at it. And that's kind of the thing. And, and they put it in their presentations. <laughs> they write whole papers in their presentations. It is like, it is, it is a bro- talk about broken anyway. So, um, but, uh, but you at the whole world is going a different direction. And so 99% will never write more than two pages again. Um, I still do page documents, pages documents, because if I feel like, because I love pages, like I know that a lot of people don't like pages. I love, it's like one of my favorite, you know, the Apple environment, because I can make pretty pictures and I can put videos in them and I can put 3D, you know, 3D stuff in them and I can make it very visual. Um, but if I'm going to, if I feel like I'm about to start writing dense keynotes, I immediately put it into prose, you know, because I can outline it really well and there's a better layout for it. But most people won't. I don't see like fortune five runs on keynote and PowerPoint and slides. Like that is, that is the lingua franca of the fortune five, except for Amazon because <laughs> Jeff Bezos doesn't like presentations. Uh, Chris. Yeah. So eighties kid here, um, kind of the same situation, never had good comprehension skills. So I had to read things over and over and over and teachers would always say, Oh, you're being lazy or something like that. And I never really knew how to say it's, it's, not being lazy. I just, I don't, but it feels it. like it. It feels like you're lazy yeah. because your brain, you literally stop. Like there's something in your, it's like, uh, like when you can't lose read. interest. Well, yeah. And, and, but you have it like it's an invisible block in that you just, but if I, I don't understand why I can't do that. But if I could see it, not like on the page, but in, like on a screen, if I could mm-hmm. see it or hear it, I comprehended it. And I had right. one teacher who kind of picked up on that. And she introduced me a long time ago to uh, books on tape. So when everybody else was reading like the great Gatsby, I got a tape of it and did just fine. Oh my gosh. That is the last book for me. 
when I read it and, and when I read the great Gatsby and got to the end and said, this was considered something that I have to read. That was mm -hmm. literally the last book I read. <laughs> yeah. I would have never, <laughs> like, I, I, mean, like, I didn't read like, any books in high school. So I just like, I, I like was, I, I was in the comments, I would do my tests. I would do my oral reports last. Mm -hmm. And I just picked up enough from what everybody else was saying. I'd BS right. my way through it. But now we homeschool three of our four children and this has kind of manifested itself in our kids. So I have one child who, who is learning to read a lot faster than the other one who's older. Um, but she's like me, if she can see it or hear it, she's fine. The other child, um, she learned, she actually learned to read uh, from following the instructions on Legos. I mean, she just figured out what it was and we would read the instructions with her and she's learned math through Legos. She's learned to, to uh, get mm -hmm. the foundations of reading through just following the instructions on Legos. Now she has no problem reading. Um, and they're all, you know, continuing to do that, but it wasn't a traditional route you go through where you sit here and you mm -hmm. ABCs and stuff like that. They just picked it up from doing something else. Exactly what you it were is, talking and about it's, earlier. It's hard to figure Like my, my son has to be challenged. Like if he's not pushed at something, like it's not interesting to him, it's just impossible. And my, my daughter has like a Lexile score. I don't know what, I don't quite understand Lexile scores, but she's 11 years old. She's got a Lexile score in the mid 1400s. Like she's, you know, she just, and I've tried to find, I can't find books to give her. Like it's like now she's in the land of like uh, hunchback of Notre Dame, which she's not interested in. Uh, go ahead, John. So just to. Oh, wrong John. Uh, provide. That's fine. John Pruitt and then oh. John. Edelson, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm in corporate as well, but I'm in a slightly different level. I'm fortune 100, not fortune five. Mm -hmm. We still write reports at the individual contributor level. We mm -hmm. still do multi-page reports at least three or four times a year. So uh, it, it doesn't make it all the way up to management because our managers then take what we write and turn them into PowerPoint slides. <laughs> There you go. Maybe I'm just, they, a, maybe I'm somewhere, I'm somewhere else that doesn't yeah. have to write that text, you know? So, so it's yeah, like, yeah. A, so that might so be, I, I'm not saying that you, that it doesn't happen, uh, right. but it does happen and it's in bullet points. Right. I have like 10 pages of bullet points sometimes. But I guess my question is, if, if we only make executives make those decisions on bullet points, why are we doing it any other way? Anyway, John and then and then Bruce. I was just going to follow up on that little C that you're talking about. Bill Rankin does a wonderful presentation about how the traditional education system would teach you how to eat. The first term would be seeing pictures of the utensils and plates and describing them and you'd remember them. Second term, they might give you some hands on. You could play with the spoons first, but they wouldn't let you play with the forks because they're sharp and the knives. And about the third course, they might actually let you put some food on it, but you, you couldn't really taste it. So he has this wonderful presentation about if you need to eat, you need to use these utensils. How would you how would you teach that topic? And it, it's a pretty funny presentation. But that's what we do. We we have students do things. We tell them all about it before we let them really try it and use it. And that's not a very effective way of teaching. Yeah, all right, Bruce. I can't hear you. All right, I'm, yeah. I've got to go back. I've, I've been fascinated by the variety of ways that we have of learning and the way that we're learning people learn and it's very rich and everything. But I do think I wanna go back, way back because I come out of the 40s and 50s training. And I have to say one good word about something really classical, a bit about the fact that why we study, why I had to study Latin, which like Alex, like you, Alex, I hated the idea. And what was it that Latin ever did for me? So I thought about that and remembered that when I took in sophomore year, Caesar's Gallic Wars. We had to study that. And our task was to translate the entire document, uh, diagram every sentence, and parse <laughs> every word. And we had to do this day by day. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. What, what is this ever going to do for me? Well, as a matter of fact, later on, it turned out that having done that, having taken apart something like that piece by piece and putting it together, that became really important one time when I had to learn new languages, when I had to go from English to learn German. And then when I went to Italy, I had to learn German. I learned Italian from reading a book for German speaking people. 
is the way I learned Italian. And it involved taking things apart, that classical method of using text. This was always done with text. And it required that breakdown. And the other piece where it really worked for me was in learning how to code for the computer. I had to learn Fortran when I went through my doctorate. And having learning that thing and learning how to take apart a coding problem and putting it together piece by piece, I thought to myself, you know, the training that I got, that hard, difficult training, which wasn't fun, did pay off later on. Now, of course, I'm finding fascination with learning things by watching YouTube videos and all of that. And again, I do a lot of reading and so forth, just like everybody else does. But what has fascinated me is the range of ways in which we can learn. And they do have this use. I just have to defend a little bit the old classical ways, which I also hated, but which I now look back on and see some practical advantage for that. Sorry for the... You no, know, I, I think it's good. I, I think that the, the challenge is really figuring out like how much pain do we need to create <laughs> to do that? Um, you know, like, and, and will every student really benefit from that? You know, I, I, you know, and I will admit that I'm a big fan of lower general standards of what needs to each, each student needs to do and more flexibility for the students. You know, like, I think that if you're not interested in math, I do think you have to get through algebra because algebra teaches you how to deal with um, vari variables and variables in life. To me, algebra is like the, and for me, calculus, but, 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 <laughs> but, but algebra is an excellent, it is, allows you to weigh variables against each other. And I think that's useful in life, but I think that anybody who's not interested in math doesn't have to get through anything more than that. And so forcing students to be tested against geometry and trig and, and um, you know, calculus and, you know, all of those other things uh, is wasting many people's time in high school because whether they could be doing what they love to do, you know, and English, I think you need to know strunk and white and that's it. <laughs> like, like, like if you, like, if you love English, you should be allowed to take classes on it forever, you know, like, uh, but if you hate English, you need to know, understand how to build a strunk and white structured sentence and how to, you know, how to, you know, do, you know, manage that and then just leave them alone. You know, like they're not, you know, cause not all of us are going to turn out to be English majors. I have to add uh, one point to this, Alex, to that point. And for me, coming from as far back as I did, technology made an enormous difference. I hated math and I was terrible in math, came close to flunking algebra in high school, but then had to do advanced statistics at my doctoral level. The difference was I had a computer to work with. And mm -hmm. in the early days, it was all slogging through and struggling. But right. when, the, when, when, first of all, the Olivetti programmable calculator came out, and then computers, right. I learned to program them and use that technology. That made all the difference in the world for people who live today. Well, the and I think that, that we can make use of technologies of various kinds, right. really makes it quite different from the old ways of having had to learn. Well, like potent, the potential of using video to do things that to show things makes a big it difference is. too. Go yeah. ahead, Chris, big and then difference. Sky. I think Sky was ahead of me. Okay, go ahead, Sky. Imagination. A book engages the imagination because you have to fill in all of the details. And of course, as we know, we always feel the movie is never as good as the book. But again, context is a movie has your, 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 your butt gets tired after 90 minutes. They figure that out. So they constrain your and allow the director to fill in your imagination. And that's why we get so much fireworks. And so that's where the context of the exercise of reverse engineering in Latin is where my wife learned early on, she put my kids in music, which taught them math, which then gave them a skill that they didn't know they were learning. And so to your point about the classical, it's the reverse engineering of learning how to learn. And so that's the, again, imagination that we're taking away by these YouTube little blipberts. Well, but uh, so I love all of this conversation. I just, how do we also excite and allow the, the stuff that's in here that we don't know that we have to let it out and not keep saying, you spelled that word wrong. You must yeah. be stupid. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. I think one of the big reveals of the uh, uh, COVID crisis for schools has been that um, curriculum is built to take up time. That a big function of schooling 
is to to keep kids in the building for six or seven hours a day. Um, and so we needed to, or it seemed like a good idea to decompose all the micro skills of math or reading, for example, uh, into lots of tiny parts that required time and practice and, and would be testable um, with short answer or multiple choice items. So now we're uh, discovering in a sense that uh, it didn't need to be that way. You might have, curriculum may well have started in the opposite direction, which is to, to give project opportunities or even to have kids decide what their projects would be. And then the teacher becomes the coach and consultant that brings in at the right time right. Uh, the missing piece. Uh, oh, you can use algebra to solve that puzzle, or you can use this concept of uh, decoding to to solve that, uh, that word problem. So, so, but we're stuck with the sunk cost of huge curricula and huge. Uh, textbook businesses and huge testing operations that are dependent on the way it's always been. Um, but it became become the way it's always been for all kinds of wrong reasons. Yeah. And, and again, I think that when I think about like the, the reason I got kind of hooked up on this creation based education is that if my kids came out of school playing instruments, my daughter's now playing like keyboard and bass you know like that's what she's doing at the moment and uh and and she's gonna add she wants to add drums and guitars she needs to do the whole thing you know and so so anyway uh the but if they came out being able to play play music cook a lot of great meals build robots you know build little bit, bits of code that fix their that, that, that kind of make their life easier make media if they're able to do that as a parent I'd be super excited, you know, like, like, I feel like they're ready for the rest of the, the rest of their lives, you know, and they can learn all the other stuff along the way, you know, like the math and the English and the other things, because they're going to need those to do those other things. But the idea is, is that, you know, if they came out being able to create things, I think the problem is, is we've now become so into testing things that we're not going to use anymore. When, once we get out of it, that we're not teaching people things that they actually would use every day. You know, I teach my, you know, my kids are learning to cook a lot, you know, and we're, we're making a lot of things together. Um, and they're 10 or 11. My goal is to have them be able to build restaurant quality. By the time they're 13, 14 years old, they can build restaurant quality. They already do that to some degree. And they're able to make the things that they love to make. Um, you know, but that's just one piece of that, of that puzzle. And I'd love school to support more of that and less of what I consider not useful. Chris, and then um, uh, uh, Chris Frischi, then, then yep. Emily, and then Chris Clark. Okay. Yeah, I can honestly tell you, had it not been for industrial arts and drafting and shop yeah. and sports, I would have had no interest in school. I mean, I did the rest of school so I could go to those classes. Shop but, class was the you know, best. And then that, you know, that mentality's changed the older you get. But yeah, I, I wish, like we send our daughter to a private school, our oldest daughter, there's, there's none of that stuff. There's no shop. There's none of that stuff. She gets all that here. Of course, we got a full garage full of stuff. But, you know, I keep telling her, I said, well, you know, you have fun doing this. If you want to bring your friends over, we'll run the saws mm -hmm. and do some welding. But yeah, I school really needs that to come back, but obviously it can't in a online learning environment. Mm, kind of. I mean, you know, like well, there's a lot of our, buy everybody a welder or no, well, but in a miniature sense, an Arduino and a, well, you know, and a soldering is something that isn't, it could be part of something like that. Go ahead, Emily. I was uh, going to say that one of the things that holds everything back is that public, the way public school is funded and saying that you know, there has to be accountability across the state and then across the nation. And so therefore kids need to be able to pass X test or Y test in order for you to continue to receive funding has caused those classes to be the first things to get cut. Because if math and reading are the only thing that you are qualifying or quantifying a school's ability to be successful, um, then you take out everything else and at what cost. And we can see just from the discussion here that most of you, myself included, were hands-on learners or wanted to figure it out on your own and wanted to get it, play with it, then ask questions. Mm. And that is the antithesis of what is actually happening 
in most classrooms and not because teachers don't want to teach that way and not because we don't want to be creative and innovative and want to do something different, but because we have, you know, expectations being passed down from fed to state to district to the teacher that your school's a failing school. So you need to teach reading. And when you, when you break it down that way, and then you pull kids, this is the other thing that kills me is when you pull kids out of class for extra reading help, and then they're missing the fun stuff that you're doing in the classroom because you're not allowed to teach while those kids are pulled out of your class. You can't introduce new content. So you end up doing something more fun, you know, like, you know, hands, let's build a bridge and out of gumdrops and toothpicks or whatever. And like those kind of things happen the enrichment stuff happens when the kids aren't those other kids aren't in the class and those are the kids that would benefit from that other way of learning and so i think that you know for major change to happen in education in the united states at least public education is we really have to think about how we're funding and how much autonomy we're giving to the districts to do what's best for the students that they have in their classrooms and if you want to hold people accountable, I understand that, but like this one blanket test fits all across the nation or race to the top or whatever it is, those things don't work. They fundamentally are flawed. And I think we know that, but we just don't know what to replace it with. All right, Chris. I'm so uh, inspired by what I've heard in the last two minutes that I'm at a loss for words. Uh, Steve, did you have your hand up? Uh, I think one of the challenges is the, is the evaluation of the student because uh, every student learns differently. They're, they're going to they're gonna be learning and reading differently or getting the information. And each student may be more of a visual learner or more of an audio learner. And so uh, can we get into a, or is this even palatable to, to, to gauge or, or to, you know, you know, to get to the... Uh, uh, student early on so you know where they're kind of guiding and then you can kind of gear the the instruction for them and how they learn again uh, the, 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 that's the, a hard thing yeah the hard part is is that the evaluation well not really uh the hard part is that i've seen systems that are private uh, in the government <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh only care about the outcome. They don't care about accountability. Yeah. They don't care right. about test scores. What they care about is that people absolutely know how to do it because oftentimes it's, it's, you know, really important, you know, that they know how to do what they're doing. And those systems uh, are able to tell you whether someone's having trouble with it and where they're having trouble with it before anybody sees it, including the user. Like I can, they can, because what they're doing is they're looking at how often you hit re rewind, how often you slow down the video, how often you, um, you know, how you interact, how fast you interact with the, with the, with the simulation, how you do, you know, like all of that stuff and a, and a big data will sit there and go, that person is having trouble with this and this is the area that they're having trouble with and this is how you fix that. That stuff already exists. You know, like it, it are, it's, it's existed for a while. <laughs> and, and so the thing is, is that, it, but, but, but they're not, but of course there's privacy issues and everything because this dig, digs deep into the like lower brain of somebody. You can, they can, you know, tell a lot about somebody based on, you know, how they learn, what they do, what, what, what they're good at, how they're not good at this, how they're, and it makes, it makes a bunch of evaluations because in that case it's, you know, life and death. And so the, they don't care about being fair. <laughs> they just care about people not dying. <laughs> so the, so the thing is, is that, um, uh, so the thing is, is that it, you, you, the stuff like that already exists that we can do that. And we are just not applying it to school for a variety of reasons. And people would decide whether they want to do it or not, but you can tell a lot about a student based on just behaviors against that. You don't need to test them. You literally don't need to test them. If you, if you're willing to let the system see the, the, if you're willing to let the great eye see, see what they're doing, um, then what you do is you can point humans at other humans that are having trouble. Like, hey, it's not a matter of punishment or measurement or accountability. It's a matter of how do, how do we get that person learning? Hey, this one's falling a little, this, this sheep is falling a little behind the rest of the pack. Let's go send someone out to do it. And you can do it really instantly before they fall so far behind that they get lost. They're just a little behind and you can see it. I don't think that's possible in a human classroom. Like, I just don't think that, I know I fell behind on a lot of things. And this is back in when we had 15 or 20 and I was gone, you know, and, and teachers, you know, didn't notice at all. You know, because I'm good at good at looking like I'm like I uh, like I'm keeping up. Uh, go ahead, Bruce. 
as we talked about this and discussed all the different methods and uh, approaches, a lot of them sound very so much about what we are, how we are teaching uh, students to take in things, to learn things. But there's another side of it that I think uh, I think we need to at least some point get to, and that is how they learn to how they learn logic, how they learn to distinguish between a valid and an invalid argument, between fake news and real news, how they develop some of the cultural values that we also want school to do. School isn't only about learning skills and about doing things that are gonna get you a good job. It's really about how do you become a good citizen? What are the fundamental values that school builds into people? And Again, in particular, in the area of all the kind of information that's being thrown at students all the time and at all of us, where is it that we learn and how do we teach people how to distinguish the good idea from the bad idea? Yeah. Well, Those are also things that are important, and I don't think skills quite get at it unless you talk well, as about a, the skill of thinking. As a parent who's very hands on, or, or, who, who lives in California, and California being very hands on about their education system, I'm very much against that. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that I don't really want my school to teach my kids how to think, you know, and, and because I, because I don't trust the school, I don't trust the state. I think that the, you know, I think that the whole thing is, is screwed up, you know? And so, you know, so the thing is, is that there, you're going to have a lot of trouble with, with parents like me when school, like the student, as soon as my school very takes one step off of you know, like the basic things that they're supposed to do, as soon as they go into anything that, that, that deals with values, they get a hellfire from, from me. <laughs> you know, like, like literally, why do, as long as they let my student, and usually what I do is I just become so much trouble that they let my, they ex exempt my school, my, my kids, because I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get people fired. You know, like, like you know, like I, I, cause I'll stir up the whole community to, to get rid of it, you know, to get rid of the whole program. And they just go, well, it's easier just to let a student, his kids not do that, you know? And so, and so the thing is, is that, so I stay out of most of that. So it's fine for schools to do it as long as, as long as I can cause trouble. But as a, as a parent, I don't want my, my school teaching my kids, you know, about, you know, their personal lives. We'll just call it that. I don't want that because I don't think that they're right. You know, and so the thing is, is that, you know, and so I, I don't want any part of that. And, and so the thing is, is that when we, I do think it's important for kids to learn that. I think that that's, you know, and I know that parents don't all do that, but I think it is the parent's job. Um, Bill? Not to raise another gigantic complexity, but on another level, schools are a diversion for vast amounts of tax money. And there are always people who get into this who have a venal desire to simply carve off pieces of that gigantic stream of money and divert it to a lot of things, whether it's mm -hmm. different versions of education or entrepreneurial things that may or may not align with education goals. And I think that is going to be one of the biggest difficulties going forward is the corporatification of education and figuring out how this privatization, public education, uh, and, and beyond works. I have no answers to it, but it concerns me vastly as I see some of these people who are now trying to make schools for profit or yeah. schools. So we, we took that one for a long time. Let's go to the next question. We've got a bunch of, we've got a bunch of questions that have stacked up. Yeah, we go sure ahead, next do. Question. James Babbitt is up next with, uh, what are some new learning skills for students given the current hybrid model? Oh, that's going to cause some. <laughs> I mean, I, I got to say that the vast majority of what my kids learn, <laughs> learn is on YouTube at this point. Like, it's just kind of an amazing, like all their study, all their whatever, because I, I tend to be very uh, stingy about their internet connection, you know, and so they have to kind of fit it into small windows. And so they, they pretty intensely, you know, go through stuff. And I just noticed that, you know, that's, that's a big chunk of how they absorb things. Go ahead, Emily, and then Chris. Well, I was going to say that, um, you know, one of the main skills, and it's something that, you know, I try to push as a tech integration person is letting the kids create and build. Um, so if during this hybrid or remote learning um, situation that we're in, giving those kids that ability to play around and figure out how to make things work um, is really another way of learning um, and incorporating that technology for their learning. So like for instance, Jamboard this week released or last week released that you can like make custom backgrounds and then write on them. And then the students were doing that and they were coming up with really great ways to create activities for the classroom and like having them 
you know, think through it and build some of the stuff that you're going to use in your class and be innovative is, is really something people should be taking advantage of in this situation. Yep. Um, other, uh, go ahead, Chris. I think an answer to the question is uh, question asking. That is uh, mm -hmm. kids, um, and we need to appreciate how good kids already are at question asking, but there's a higher premium on uh, asking questions that will get you the answers to move forward in the project that you're doing or learning about the, the thing that you're curious about. But the way you frame the question in a Google search it makes a difference <laughs> the, as to the, the answers you get. The joke, the joke in our, in our family, that's very common. It's not what you know, it's how well you Google, you know, is, 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 you know, and that's usually followed up with, uh, your Google is as good as mine. If I, if anyone in my family asks a question that could be easily Googled, all of us will come back to you going, well, your Google is as good as mine. Cause I'm just going to go Google that. And, and it is, it, you're absolutely right though. Learning, learning Google skills is actually a pretty important set of skill sets more, probably more important than keeping the information in your head is knowing how to get to it. Um, it's why I've seen some education programs, not, Oh, I was just talking about this. It was one of the classes that my kids are in. There's no, you're allowed to use Google for the tests. Like they don't have any, and that because the teacher believed that it's more important for the kids to know how to get to the information than to actually remember the information and they build it. It's a, it's a com more complicated test too. It's harder to learn. They have to, to find all that stuff. There's a, a it's a much bigger um, Easter egg hunt, you know, to find all the things that they need to answer the questions. So it's a harder test, but they're allowed to use Google because the teacher's teaching them to use Google, you know, like to, to figure those things out. Go ahead, Sky. Where does, where does critical thinking fit into this question? And I guess Emily, and I haven't heard much from Kara. So I'm just curious, where does that concept, the soccer, the soccer I guess I would say that the a part of it is in discussion, like in general discussion. And I think that also in projects, you know, you have to be critical. You have to be able to critically think in projects. And then I think that what we're doing here, you know, critical discussions where students are able to have an open discussion where we're not a, not a lecture. That's where it doesn't exist, I don't think. Um, you know, so, so I think that being able to have discussions with students and having them ask those questions, I think is a big, you know, piece of it. Um, uh, what were you, Steve, you were, you don't, you don't think so? Are you disagreeing or are you? Are you I, I agree. I agree. It's just hard to get, uh, to yeah. encourage some students to participate in the discussion. You can throw things a lot out there, but then, well, it, I, um, that's, that's, uh, the and maybe that's their part. style too. Some, some yeah. people get the whole thing by sitting in the back and just absorbing it, you know, right. and that's, that's part of the, what they do. And then also the other thing is, is that like our system here is, that we, uh, there's some of us that want to talk on video, but there's a whole bunch of folks that are all chatting with each other the whole time during the show. And they're asking questions here and they're not the ones that want to, you know, like we have the, uh, is he here? Hold on. He's gone. We have the mysterious A. Mitchells. <laughs> We're probably going to listen to this later. Everyone wants to know what, who A. Mitchells is because he, you know, he doesn't, doesn't ask a lot of what we've, we've heard. We heard him in one of the early ones. It was like, it was like seeing Sasquatch. And, and so it was uh, like we heard him for a moment in, in one of the early, early videos. And so, you know, but but that's, you know, and people, uh, you know, it, but the, the, the point is, is that 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 is uh, that's the way that A. Mitchells has decided to interact with this group. And I think that we want to be able to make sure that it's safe for everyone to do it via text mm -hmm. or via audio only via, you know, all those things, because that's just the way they are, you know. And so yeah. and we there's certain things that we say, hey, you got to use video for certain things because of safety and people feeling comfortable. But I always work. That's why we have disc that's why we have discord. And that's why we, we use webinar instead of meetings is specifically to allow people to choose the mode in which they want to interact with this with this group, uh, Bruce, and then Cara. We were talking about the skill of looking up <clears throat> in Google and finding things in Google. I'm finding myself wondering because I'm fascinated by this now. Are there techniques and skills for going through YouTube to find things? Seems to me YouTube well, they're the has same. everything. But, you know, you can, are there tricky ways to find it like you have in Google? Uh, uh, there are. Well, I don't use a lot of the tricky search terms. I just am really good at nouns and, you know, like how to organize nouns because the first, na the first, the first variable is the most important. And then you keep on the, the you, you, you want to go from the most important to the least important in your search. If you rearrange those, you get an entirely different search, you know? And okay. so that's the thing that, that is the most important as you, and I, I've, after 20 years of it, 
I just think in it. Like literally I'll just type and I'll just, I'll, I'll order things in the way that I needed to order to come out with the search that I'm looking for. Or I'll rearrange the order if I don't get what I'm looking for. Uh, Cara? Yeah. Cara, did you? Oh, there you go. You're using a keyboard, aren't you? I am. I'm trying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So we, 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 we know the symptoms of using a keyboard instead of your mouse. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I actually put, had Paul put it into the questions. I'm not sure if it's going to come through. Yeah, but yeah I, it'll, it'll come through. We'll get, we'll, I would, we'll get through. Um, it, it. Well, I just wanted to, I guess, address like Sky's uh, question of, um, you know, it, I think there's a fine line of like, can we teach awareness of yourself enough to know that whatever is being taught in the way that it's being taught isn't working for you. So it's not so much of right. a, I'm a visual learner, I'm a whatever, but, but um, I'm just interested because I'm, I'm not in elementary at all. I'm, I'm more in higher education and I get to, um, I, I teach a lot of resourcefulness. So I don't teach them the actual content. I teach them where to find the content when they need the content, go, and understand where you can look for it and where you can find it. But then also when it's like research driven, how to properly search for a research article and, and things and how to um, somewhat identify the critical points of it. But again, um, that's higher education. So I'm just curious of, of, yeah. So can we teach people that awareness of, of how to know that something's not like asking the why, you know, I was always taught to ask why, oh, yeah. why, 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 why for my and own personal self. Well, how to learn how to learn. Exactly. Learn how to learn. Yeah. And, and I think that, again, I think that finding ways to challenge people because people will be hungry to learn when they're challenged about things that they're excited about, you know, so it's, it's figuring out a way that, that we can manage that. It's easy for me to, you know, I, you know, uh, recently I had to learn, you know, I knew a fair bit about HDR. <laughs> I've learned a lot in the last little last six months because I have to, you know, and it's, it's what I'm, you know, and, but I wasn't ready to learn all of it until I was, I was, I learned enough of it to get into the door. Then I had to learn the rest of it really fast, you know, and I, I had to learn resolve in a week, you know, to, to solve a bunch of problems. And, and so the, the, and it sat there on my desk and I, I'd open it up and only knew how to correct <laughs> images with it until, until I needed it. And so, the so I think that we have to find ways that get that get kids excited and kids are excited. I, I still I, I know I've said this before, but I really feel like kids know what they want and they know what they love to do. And I just feel like I see it over and over again that by the time they get out of high school, that love of whatever they were interested in is so beaten out of them that they, you know, because they had so many deadlines and so many things, and there was so many, so many people marking off their, their wrong spellings and so many, whatever, that they don't even know what they like and, and don't like anymore. You know, and I think that our school system is extremely good at that right now. It's just beating out of people passion, you know, and I think that, you know, and, and I felt like I survived it. I survived school with passion, mostly because I fought it you know, like I was just difficult. Was, you know, like, you know, so, so, but, but I think that a lot of students um, aren't as difficult, you know, and they, and they're told not to. My parents, you know, uh, my parents had almost no rules. You know, there was no direct disobedience and no lying. Like that was it, <laughs> you know, and, and so no, direct obedience that they'd make the rules up as they went, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, don't do that again. And then, then it's direct disobedience. So it, it's an open-ended thing, but there was, that was it. You know, and, and so like we kind of grew up in a, a definitely the ultimate free range, literally free range. We grew up on a farm. So, um, uh, but, but I think that um, I do think it's challenging for students to, you know, especially when their parents, both parents are working and both parents, you know, we have that, we have both parents working. And it was, I don't think that was a good idea when we weren't all at home. I think that was like a, you know, I think we shouldn't have been both working. I think that we lost a lot of time. We lost a lot of opportunity with our kids. I probably wouldn't do it again. I, you know, and, um, you know, uh, but now that we're home, we see them all the time. <laughs> so, so like we're, we're both working, but we're all, we're all here together and we're all talking about our, our homework probably more than my parents ever talked to me about mine. Uh, Sky. I was told once that you're going to learn one of two ways, either interest or discipline. And so you talk about making it more interesting and something you want to learn about. But again, there are certain techniques like eating and again, John's saying it took three sessions, uh, three, I could, yeah. you know, three courses to learn how to eat. It's like, well, that's because that was designed by somebody trying to keep a job to teach that process. It wasn't to design to help you learn how to eat. 
Well, there's, it's hard because you've got to figure out how to cover all the bases. Like we, we built a new rig that we have to send out to people who don't know how to use video. So how do you build a rig that is really high end that we send you a couple boxes and you have to open it up and put it together by yourself. And we've been challenged by that <laughs> in the last week where if I give it to you only with text, complete chaos, you know, we, and we've angry people and everything else. The video, once you see the, if you watch the video and I had to make, the, so the other thing is, is I'm dealing with people who don't have a lot of time. So I kept on compressing that video. So the first video we shot, it was 12 minutes. Then I cut it down to five minutes. And then I time scaled everything down to two minutes and 15 seconds. <laughs> like all you have to do is watch. You just have to, you just have to watch for two minutes and 15 seconds. And you'll completely understand how you do this. Then there's text that explains, you know, all the bits with pictures that explain all those things. And then I get on the call. I get on a call with you when you're setting it up and answer your questions and help you put it together. Um, you know, and, and, and that's the, but that's the, it's using when, all when of Microsoft, those. When Microsoft first set out Windows 95, the book was two books. And the first, the first half was all text because they're coming from DOS. The second half was all pictures because they just introduced Windows as a thing. Right, right. GUI. Well, and I'm probably, the next time I send the kid out, I'm probably including an iPad with a self-running app that you just literally open it and go like this. And it has the videos exactly the way I want them. And it has the text that I want them. And for the cost of these kids, an iPad isn't that big of a deal. So, but I just want literally, I want to know how you're going to, how you're going to get the information from me. Um, exactly. I want to control the entire format, um, which I didn't. And I'm literally going to have an iPad with a stand. <laughs> Let's put the stand up with the iPad up and go up here and just go like this. And it'll, it'll, it'll tell you what to do next, uh, John. And then, and then Chris. Well, it's back to your Google, your Google search search is as good as mine. Not all Google searches are equal. So I taught people. <laughs> well, that's you know, what I say. Oh, yeah, so maybe maybe my girl's Google search is better than other yeah, people. Yeah, it may be. But Venn diagrams, Boolean logic, and don't stop on the first page is what our students did. Yeah, I mean, and, and everything, the critical, most critical thing for me on, on everything is uh, uh, reduce the variables and then slowly add the variable back in with each piece working. When something isn't working, that's all, that's all I do. Like my whole day is all just reduce variables, add variables back in, and then don't trust anything. Don't, don't trust any single point of data. Uh, Chris. Yes. Yeah, so we just had an example of killing joy with students the other day. My daughter came home and she was kind of stressed out about a project they had to do, which was a, uh, it's the four P's uh, product. Um, I don't forget what the other three are, but she had to come up with this idea of a product. And she was all excited because on her way home, she had thought up this cool idea because every, she said everybody else in her class was going to do an app. That was just the limitation of what they, let's just do the, we'll do an app, we'll be done. I won't have to put any time into this. We probably spent two hours at the dinner table coming up with this elaborate backstory and embellishing it because it's a herbal, uh, herbal, it's an oral uh, presentation she has to give, you know, on the, on the, in the class. And, um, I said, well, hey, before we finish this, why don't you call your teacher and just make sure he's okay with this because the concept was a personal teleportation device. And she emailed him and she gave him a, a, you know, a paragraph of what's going on. And he said, no, just do something that can actually be made. And you would have just seen the joy. And then she's like, fine, I'll do an app. Right. I mean, it was just, it sucked. I wanted to email him back and say, Yo, what are you doing? But I it's didn't. It's hard. You know, I think the teachers have a hard time with, you know, I know that I was in, when I was in uh, grade school, you know, it's really, I was, I went to a parochial school. I was really into religion. I mean, I really liked it until I was about 11. You know, I was really, really into it. I read, read all this stuff and everything else. And I got a D in religion, you know, in, in, a, in a parochial school. That's pretty much the end. <laughs> like, like, like at, at, for that moment, for a very long time, it was, it was like, I just pretty much then I was like, okay, you know, like, like, it's the only D I'd ever gotten in my entire life, you know? And so I was just like, well, this isn't for me. <laughs> and so I, and off I went, you know, and now I, I came back around. I ended up being a philosophy, major, you know, Eastern philosophy major and then, and then a lot of other things, but, but it, uh, uh, but it, it took me a long time to come back after, you know, getting that. And I think teachers sometimes don't realize what D's look like to students. It just means don't do this anymore. Uh, well, I question. told her we'd make a video of it if she wants to, and she can send her teacher the link to the YouTube video. Right, right exactly. But when you put that up, you have to let us know, and then we'll all because we want to see lots of views. So anyway, uh, yeah. Next, next question. 
Roscoe Jones has one, and I'm a little split as to whether this is two parts of one question or two separate. Uh, he starts, what has been your experience with smart classrooms? And he defines that as pre-configured lecture, playback, or distance learning. And then uh, John and others, what are you hoping to see grow from Zoom OSC? Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, well, just uh, first, I just want to say to everyone on the panel, watch yesterday's show about Zoom OSC oh, and watch, Al watch Alex. Alex's brain is just sitting there spinning and everyone's <laughs> commenting on it in the chat going, oh my gosh, look at Alex. And he, the truth is it's, it's, it's a really good show. And there were so many implementations of this. So my first question is to the educators, how many of you have, have walked into a smart classroom or had access to one or tried to teach in one, you know, where you have to learn all the buttons and the specialty things they're programmed for. And then secondarily, right now where we're operating through Zoom and that's our teaching method, then Zoom OSC gives us that ability to take the complicated things that Zoom can do and put them into a really basic structure, possibly. So that's kind of the two parts. Go ahead, John. Oh, there's a poster that I have that says, if this classroom is so smart, why can't I figure out how to use it? Why does it need me to operate it? So the, 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 I am getting it done over the Christmas break. I'm getting the, my system back up so I can show it to people. Um, but I built, you know, I built these for myself for a decade. And the first one had 16 monitors and five, you know, five uh, cameras and all that. It was too much. Now I keep on whittling it all down. But the point is, is that uh, the big thing that I learned really quickly, if I'm running it myself, is that I can't have a bunch of buttons. So mine are all like touch screens that are visual. Like I can see the video feed that I might send you in front of me in a Wacom tablet and I tap on it. Like I'm tapping on it. There's no interface. I had to write, not write, I had write, written. I designed and had someone write a Telestrator app that doesn't have any interface because I don't want it. To, I don't want it to have any interface. I just want to be able to draw on things. And so I want to look over and look down and draw on them. But if it takes us more than a second to learn how to use it, I was like, that's going to be too much, you know, and, and it all has to be, um, you know, and then I'm working on some switching systems that are attention based and so on and so forth. And so the, it has to be seamless. And I will say that the thing that one of the things that makes start smart classrooms hard is hybrid. Hybrid is like, the reason I'm one of the reasons that I don't like hybrid classes is because I have spent a decade teaching classes seated like this with screens in front of me that are that basically encase me. So I don't have to I can't see and I couldn't do a hybrid. I couldn't do what I do in a hybrid class. And I've tried to do it in front of uh, I've tried to use do my, my method in front of a lot of people. And it's really difficult. I'd rather just come in as a video screen. Like literally, if you ask me to speak at an event, I would much rather come in over your video screen than ever show up in person because I have so many tools at my disposal of playback and drawing and everything else that I can interact with. And I think that that's going to be, you know, if you, once you get the, the people out of the way of the classroom part and let the teacher have the tools at an arm's reach that they can get to everything and then get rid of the interface, you end up with something that you can pretty seamlessly have a lot of conversations with folks, but um, go ahead, John. And you asked what, what did we see from that session yesterday? My point where things just exploded is when he says he's doing this for magic shows. Right. And this is when I started saying, oh, that's what teachers are doing. They're giving directions. They're looking for misdirections. They want to be able to quickly aggregate information. They want to be able to push the button and get that happening. So I just started thinking of a magic show versus a classroom. And then I started thinking what you can do. And there's so many things that probably aren't going to become functions or features in a normal Zoom because they have to reduce the clutter. Zoom is so easy, but it's something mm -hmm. like this would let me, oh, I could rearrange my breakout rooms. I can well, there was a whole bunch together. of There's a whole bunch of things that some people at Zoom have gotten a bunch of requests from me. And it literally on Friday, I was like, I'm not making any more requests because it, it's already possible. Like I don't need Zoom to, to do those things. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, that's what, what my head turning was thinking about all the things that I've been asking people at Zoom to do and going, nope, I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to ask for this. I don't need to ask for this. I don't need to ask for this. I don't, you know, like, and, and I just, what I need to ask for is any hooks in the API that aren't there, you know, is, is all I'm interested in now um, is, is making sure that Zoom OSC has that. And that's also why I brought those guys in. I want them to be successful. I want them to keep doing this and growing it so that we can keep doing really cool things with classrooms, uh, Roscoe. Yeah, I've seen about four iterations of smart classrooms come through. And so there's there's the the two of them would be the presentation classrooms where they're putting in a good VHS player, 
sorry, that tells you how old I am. Yeah. Then a DVD player, you know, and actually DVDs, nobody liked because you to find something, the VHS was pre queued I actually have a professor who retired because he could no longer get VHS into his classroom because he had, he was a Shakespeare professor and he could queue up all his tapes to show exactly the point he wanted. And within five seconds of him loading that tape, it was showing the students what he wanted to explain to them. DVDs, mm -hmm. menu systems, lost, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's the computer smart classrooms where either the teacher could take control over all the computers in the classroom and that, so I was wondering if, you know, if people see those type of iterations, because they're not, they're not about multimedia and kind of the way you were mm -hmm. describing, it's more about a presentation station or in a computer classroom, the ability to take control of all the computers and show things. Well, but I can do that for mine. Take you know, control like of other people's computers by share screen, you mean? Or A ARD, what? Apple remote desktop. I'm VPN into yeah. the classroom. So I'm VPN into the classroom. I can pick up any students uh, when I'm, when when, when we're doing it, when we're doing it, I can pick up, I can jump into any student's computer. Not only that, I can pull their computer up to my platform and draw on it. So, or, or, so, or use it as so, an example. So, you know, no, I'm just saying or, I can pull it up as an example yeah, yeah. from okay, anywhere great. in the world and I can telestrate over okay. top of it. Cool. You know, like, you know, and so, and, and I can compare them to mine. I can, you know, do all, you know, like all of that stuff is. Um, Are there any videos of you teaching? Uh, we haven't record. There's pictures of me teaching years ago okay. with a very early version. Um, It'd be interesting to analyze. Well, once I get the reason I'm putting the system back together is to do it with all of you. So, so it's okay. it, it's coming it's coming soon. Uh, you know, I again, it's just been um, too much production uh, and, and uh, me not being able to. I'm slowly delegating myself out of a job. Uh, Bruce and then and then John. When you do that um, demonstration and you said, can you do that as part of the one that the we educators can come to or let it be known so that we can. It'll be on a Saturday. We can see you. It'll be a Saturday. Excellent. Great. Well, great. The, the thing is, is that it'll be everything. Like once I get it back up, um, it'll be in, you'll see pieces of it all the time. All like right. I just, it's just that I had to tear it apart and it. That's great. It sounds crazy, but I gave all my SDI cables to the production you know, so it's not just that I have to put the, all the gears sitting right here over, over on the other side of my computer, but I have to build a bunch of new SDI cables and I just haven't, ha it's, it's, it's not the putting together. It's me having to build, you know, 200 SDI cables. That's the, between me and getting this thing built again. It's because there's just a lot of routing um, that I do for, for my system. Um, again, I'm going to try to build a smaller mobile system that is a little easier, but right now the big system takes a little bit of time. And then I, my wife doesn't like having a server. I mean, a, a rack in the living room. So the other piece of this is that over the Christmas break, I have to run fiber between my server room and my house and my office, which right now is only cat five. So I have to rerun uh, TAC 12 from one place to the other to, so that I can store the video equipment where my wife approves of it. So it's uh, just an important piece of life. Um, next, next question. I think we're up to the one that Kara mentioned earlier, which is the Paul Prusikowski question. Uh, how are elementary students learning self-awareness and emotional intelligence? Are we teaching students to recognize when a method that is being used doesn't work for them, as well as awareness to know that they need to look at it from a different perspective? I don't know. The overall question I do, I do want to ask is whether students should be taught that at school. Like, like, you know, like it's some of it should be there. I mean, definitely. But I think that we lean a lot on schools to do a lot of things for us that, you know, I, I just think we just be careful of, of, of that process. That's all. Uh, Emily and then Bruce. Um, in direct answer, in elementary schools, we do SL, SEL, which is social emotional learning as being that's like the new hot bingo word of the year um, in the classrooms. And it's you know, it's necessary for kids to know. And then the growth mindset has been around and the, the power of yet is constantly being taught to the kids so that when you have a math teacher in high school, who's like, you're an idiot, you can go, no, I just don't get it yet. Um, or I don't understand it yet and keep moving on. Um, so teaching students, I think teaching students that that's okay is really important and teaching teachers that if a student comes to you and says, I'm not getting it the way you're giving it to me and I, I need something else or I need a different resource or whatever is really important. And I think that we do need to teach them to be self-advocating um, as far as it being like regimented currently the SEL part of it um, and the classroom is in, at least in New York state is being pushed pretty heavily, but um, it's not, you know, it's not being taught in a, 
uh, consistent manner across grade levels or, or for kids. Um, but you definitely, you walk into school buildings now and it's all over the poster, you know, the bulletin boards, um, prior to COVID, it was all, you know, the power of yet the power of growth mindset thinking forward. Um, and, and that kind of thing, but it's also become commercialized, which bothers me because it's like cans now. And so then it doesn't feel authentic. So that's, that's my personal issue with it. I go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so I hope I'm oh, understanding sorry, this, ahead, this question correctly. I was typing it in, but I figured I would just do it here. So I loved my upbringing. I grew up in North Georgia. We had a tight group of people, about eight or 10 of us. I was involved in scouts. This was from middle school all the way through high school and then in college. And we learned so much just from being around each other. We all had differing opinions. We all had different likes and dislikes. And we learned how to deal with who gets to decide where we're going to eat to, you know, now versus blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was so much that was learned just from that, that wasn't taught in school. A teacher didn't tell me how to decide which idea is right and which idea should, you know, is wrong. We just learned this from being around each other. I don't know if, did I misunderstand no, I the question? No, I, I, I think that that's, uh, that was kind of something I was pointing to. And, and, and again, I, it's a limitation of my own. I know that we're trying to have schools do everything for the parents. So the parents don't have to think about it. That's how it feels sometimes. You know, I feel like most of what I use on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I didn't get at school like at all. And, 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 and I, and I, and I, and I say that as I want school to provide that for my student, my, my kids, but I learned to program on my grandfather's computer at home, you know, in, in his, in his, uh, he had a, my grandfather was very, a geek. And uh, so I learned to program there. I learned photography because my my uncle gave me a, a camera, a K1000 and lots of film and taught me how to develop. And so I learned how to do that. I learned mostly how to be appropriate on a farm, you know, where uh, you'd be, you know, ridiculed heavily and, and put into dangerous positions if you weren't, if you're were a pain. Um, and, uh, you know, and I learned a lot of uh, toughness skills because, uh, some police officers in in my in my uh, in my town were seals, uh, former seals from, and uh, so they put together basically Boy Scouts on steroids, um, which is a whole different. You know, I learned a lot of things that I probably shouldn't have learned, but I, I learned a lot of things that were useful as well. Um, and so, but I learned all these things outside of it, you know, and, and working on projects, and and I learned how to do audio in my church. You know, like I, you know, and, and even after that, that bad grade that I got, I still got to church every, every week because my, my, my uncle Tom <laughs> would, would teach me how to do, uh, uh, audio. <laughs> so as I sat up in the, in the little thing, mixing all the mics and everything else, uh, at 12, you know, and so I learned, you know, how to do all those things, um, outside of school. And those are the things that I use every day. Um, and I, you know, I, I learned basic reading skills, but I got that because mostly I got really good at reading what I needed to read because I needed it for other things that are outside of school again. Um, John and then Bruce and then uh, Cara and then Emily. Well, when you discuss that, I can't, you know, sit back and not bring up the equity issue. Yeah, no, the I, access that you had. And you're, that's, yeah. you're, you're right. I mean, I came from a upper middle class family with a large farm with a, my, my, my father's a lawyer. My mother has a master's in education. It's not the same. Like, no, I, I totally, you know, uh, I totally agree with you, but I do think that even in the environment, I, you know, I live in an area where, you know, I live in Marin, you know, and I just, I, I do feel like uh, a lot of parents here live in nice houses with nice cars and don't spend a lot of time with their kids. You know, like I just, just, it's just something that, that shows up for me a lot. Uh, go, <laughs> go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, I think what this brings up the notion that learning is all a whole life thing. Oh, yeah. You learn from every different conceivable place. And the question that I think was raised about was about how, how and to what extent these uh, issues about values should be in the schools. And I tend to agree with your view, Alex, that it's up to the parents, it's up to the community, it's up to the village. The schools, it seems to me, if they're going to involve in it all, the question would be how are the teachers being prepared? to do things like mm -hmm. these new approaches to learning and new approaches to correction. It's not so much as whether are they, where are they happening? Well, and and in I think the, we're in the grade schools, it's what's happening in the colleges that are teaching the teachers. And, and I think that the other thing though, is that I think we put teachers in an unfair position of asking them to do a bunch of these things that, that, um, that are really outside of, of education, in my opinion. Um, you know, and, and I think that we do need to have like what's appropriate to be in a school because 
that's a, you know, you need appropriate students makes it easier to learn. But I think that getting too deep into that stuff puts teachers in a really complicated position that I, I don't know if it's fair to them to, to do that. Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, the equity thing that John brought up that okay. not everyone has those abilities. And then we put that, you know, to have those experiences or access to those things. And then we put that on the school to provide it. Right. And then the schools have to come up with a way. And then, you know, in addition to being teachers, we have to be social workers and we have to know how to feed these kids and we have to know how to report abuse on these kids. And we have to know, you know, how does this kid learn and where, where's their short fallings in a greater scheme of things. And so like we end up, you know, one of the things that COVID showed us was that, yeah, we are a glorified daycare in a lot of senses um, at the K-12 or at least the K-6 level. And that, you know, we're providing a lot of resources and sources through our schools, like dentists come into our schools and doctors come into our schools to do clinics for kids who can't go to doctor's appointments because their families can't take them. And so I remember like, I, when I taught at a school that was considered a, you know, high risk school, the kids, uh, I got them into a photography program and they took us on a field trip out to the woods in Connecticut. Now Connecticut's not very huge. So like in my head, I thought these kids had all been outside of our town, which was a suburb. It wasn't like, you know, the city, the inner city or anything. And the kids, when we got there, were like literally scared to get off the bus because they're like, miss, are there bears here? Like, are we gonna, like, is it okay to get off the bus? Are you sure? And like, they were just asking all these questions and like, and I it just remember it like being eye opening to me because I was like, oh my God, they've never left, you know, well, the little town we're from. And, and like, you know, haven't stomped through the woods like I did as a kid or, you know, went and did all these things that I know how to do. And I, I just turned around to them. I was like, how are you guys going to survive the zombie apocalypse if you don't know how to start a fire and walk through some woods? Well, and and they a... laughed, but they, you know, it's all that, you know, kind of it, that ex experience was so important. And so like getting people in the future to continue that program, like when I left that school, I handed off to someone and I was like, you need to continue this at all costs because that exposure is extremely important to these kids. They get to learn how to use cameras. They get to interact with other kids from different communities. They get to go out into the woods or into, you know, different parts of the state that they haven't been to before. We went to the ocean, we went to inner city and we took photos. And then they told stories through those photos that they took. Um, and that's really important. So I think finding those things is important, but we put too much of that on the the schools to be the parents and the teachers and then get mad when teachers have you know like oh well i put a value on them that they should make this important to them right, right. Um, you know exploring the world should be important to you and yeah. you know then parents get mad why'd you tell my kid they can't do x y or z or that they should go do this you know i don't have money mm -hmm. for that why would you do that you know right. like it right. gets complicated yep yep Cara, did you have something a while ago Nope. Okay. Uh, Chris? Yeah. So I was a little bit on the other side, oh. John. So we Two grew Chris's. up. There we go. Keep, go. keep going. Go ahead. Yeah. So we, I grew up poor. So I was with a bunch of, you know, people where I lived, you know, we were used to powdered milk and government cheese, you know, mom was on food stamp stuff. So we didn't have, um, as some of you might, as some people listening to this might consider, you know, privilege, uh, that's a different, com you know, uh, conversation. But so when things broke at our house, you know, grandpa had to fix them. We didn't, we couldn't go out and buy one. So we learned so much, you know, if somebody's fixing a washing machine or a dryer or a car, we're out there fixing it with them. So while we might not have had um, the, the money status per se to be able to experience these things, we experienced other things that I know today that kids get, go to my daughter's private school, have no idea how to do some of them, you know, they might have a hard, where do I put the gas in the car? Um, they can't figure this stuff out. My daughter knows how to break down a carburetor just because I drive a 82 Land Cruiser. Um, but scouts and, and being in the woods of North Georgia, we were surrounded by trees. So while other kids were experienced with computers and stuff, hey, right. we were building fires and figuring out how to, you know, dig holes after watching Red Dawn and, um, you know, build little my, huts to hide in. My, know, we my, learned life skills. My, my wife, uh, she was asking why I don't, like, I talk about 
camping a lot or going out into the woods a lot and spending nights in the woods and stuff like that as a kid. And he's like, why don't you camp anymore? I was like, cause I don't understand the whole tent thing. <laughs> like, like I was like, I don't, I don't understand like the tent thing. Like for me, camping was, I had a poncho on, I would go out and cut down a little, you know, I'd build a lean to and I put the poncho over top of it. Then I put brush on top of that. And that was my, that's how I did it. Like the, the, the tent thing is very complicated and having to schedule a time to be there. And like all the things that I'm not, I'm just not, I don't understand all the things. Cause we just, I would just, you know, put a knife on and go out in the woods, you know, and, and that was, that was uh, camping. What, and so one of the best experience, life experiences I've ever had. And I do this with my kids as part of the reason why I have a Land Cruiser was when I was growing up, my best friend's dad had a, um, he had an 82 FJ 40. I don't know if you guys know what oh, that yeah. is. It's the short I little do. Toyota. And my we second would come favorite home from, car. Yeah. We would come home Defender from school. I've, I've owned one, but we would come home from school. There'd be a note taped on the door that would say something like you can have 50 feet of rope, you can have one jacket, one axe, you know, and some food and stuff. And then he would, and he'd give coordinates. We'd have to look up on the map where it was. We'd have to cross the river without getting wet. We'd have to, he might have a line up, but we had to get all the gear across. Or he would just take us driving on the dirt roads and he'd see like a little washout trail and he'd be like, all right, we're going up that trail. Let's figure out how to get the truck up that trail. And we'd have to We'd have to dig out. We'd have to stack rocks. We'd have to do whatever we could do to do traction. Those were so important learning experiences, much more than, you know, who wrote what novel. I mean, I hate to say that, but. Go ahead, Chris Clark. First, I wanted to say to Emily that uh, are there bears there is actually a good question whenever you're on a bus. Uh, Even if the answer is no, (laughs) it's, it's a great question. Um, especially if you're in school in Montana. Um, On another point, um, I think part of the dilemma we've got, the box we've got ourselves in with schooling and our dissatisfactions with it as it is, or as we experienced it, is that um, teacher preparation is focused on teaching teachers how to behave as teachers. It's not focused on learning. So it's driven by a kind of uh, liturgy of teaching. It's the the altar boy learning how to say the right Latin responses at the right time. And if it were flipped and uh, driven by uh, questions and answers about how to to be a, a learning coach, how to support the learners, the learners are doing the learning, it's invisible. Learning is invisible. And uh, that's, that's the flaw of most testing mm-hmm. is that it's trying to infer learning or knowledge or skill on the basis of uh, performances that are very distantly related to right. the learning. Um, in any case, um, the focus of teacher education should be on how learning works and how you can, as a teacher, how you can either be helpful or get out of the way uh, oh, and- rather than on, okay, what, what intervention, what do you have to do to control learning? Because mm-hmm. we don't know how to do that. And right. we do more harm than good when we try to control it and make it convergent so that everybody is distributed oh, on a, a normal, curve uh, on the same skill the 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 thing that i found to be one of the most important things is when people are excited about something uh it's really easy to keep them all going the same direction it's when they're not excited about it they're all going everywhere you know and so you know trying to keep everybody thinking in the same direction is such a big piece of it and excitement is the key aspect of that um and the problem is so it's harder to the, the more you hang push you know more you push down on the students or make it you know, try to control it, the, the more they don't want to be there. And then the more that they find other things to do. And at least, you know, and so uh, I, I, all the teachers that I remember that were, that we listened to all the time were the ones that told great stories and we had a lot of fun. Not all of it was totally uh, connected to school, <laughs> to, to school. Um, you know, like we, and, and we get these, you know, like great metaphors, you know, from teachers that would explain it, but all of it happened almost the reason that we do this, right. Is because almost all of it happened in conversation. 
it didn't happen in the lecture, didn't happen in the in the uh, in reading and everything else. It had happened in a conversation in the class. And the teachers that were more conversationally based were the ones that I at least identified with better. Um, next question, Paul Wallace. Education, how important is it to encourage kids to keep a daily journal? I don't think it's important at all. Like, I don't even think it's a good idea. Anyway, um, go ahead, Carl. I think um, just kind of back to your other point, too, is that when I'm the kind of learner that, like, as soon as I'm told to do something a certain way, I'm probably going to not want to do it that way. <laughs> I'm I I, there's like there's a barrier of of like people telling me what to do like and and me not understanding the why behind that and Mm. and I have to figure out the why otherwise I'm not just going to follow suit just because you told me what to do so I think when you when you tell or encourage a certain activity too much or you press it too much with students they're going to somewhat like just feel forced into it if they, mm-hmm. if they like it, encourage it. But, but if it's forced, they're, they're like Alex is saying with all of this is that when you force something too much with anything, I think in life, when you force it too much, it, uh, it starts to get um, well, and, and fun. I think passion is a very, uh, passion is a very delicate flower that is easy to extinguish. Fresh. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and forever. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's the thing we forget in education often. Uh, Bill? And, I, I think, and, and work. I mean, it's something that you just have to worry about. Bill, and then Paul, and then John, and then we'll move on. There, there's two things I wanted to say. Number one, I hate it, but I'm going to give you the it depends answer. And here's why. Uh, for me, I never did any of that up until I hit probably my early 30s. But the cone that I involved myself in was getting a job where I had to write an article every month on deadline. And it was essentially journaling for me because I was on deadline. I had to do that over and over again. And I can't tell you how it expanded my ability to organize thinking and to structure work so that I always knew I had those skills. And I learned things that I would not have learned about myself and how I put out information if I hadn't done that. One of the most surprising to me is how I learned that over and over and over again, on article after article, I was always bearing the lead three paragraphs down. That is a mechanical thing, but it was, it took me that much time when I started thinking through the subject to get my own head into the nugget of what I really needed to lead with. And so I forgave myself for that. I was constantly dumping two paragraphs. And so just that repetition was hugely valuable for me as a writer. I think that when I, the the definition I have is journaling is where they are personally, or or that's what I'm thinking of when you think of of personal journals (laughs) of where they are personally. And I think it's extreme defining who we are prematurely is really dangerous in my opinion. Oh, I'm only a visual learner means that they're not going to listen to anything else. And because they decided that that's the way they are, you know, and, and I, you know, I take, I don't like, I don't, I won't take any personality tests because I, I don't want to be, I don't, I, no, no one fits into any of the boxes. You know, that's the, that's the truth. Nobody fits into the boxes and the, and the, the, the to quantize, to quantize people and to have them self quantize, you know, uh, is, um, you know, I think that you just have to be, you know, I will argue that your surface of reality is where you stopped. Not, it's not where you're going, where you're going is there's no surface. There's no, you know, but where you stopped is what your surface of reality is, you know, and it's just a, um, and so you stop by defining it and deciding what it is, you know, and then, and that's what it is, you know, it becomes the thing that you, you interact with rather than you're interacting with the, um, construct instead of, instead of the, uh, the true reality of it, which is undefinable. Uh, go ahead, Paul, and then John. Yeah, I just I just brought it up because I wish I had kept a journal all my life, you know. And uh, if there's a way to introduce the idea of doing a journal without force feeding it, like you were suggesting, I think it at least exposing students mm-hmm. to the to the idea and the possible future value of having a journal. Yeah, That's I have a friend. I <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I have a specific opinion because I, I have a friend whose significant other read through their journals and then they've had trouble ever since, you know? And so like, to me, I'm like, that's why you don't write journals. Like that's, you know, like, like don't write why, where you are at that. Cause that's where you are at that moment. Not 10 years later. Go ahead, John. And journaling can be an interesting, interesting 
thing, uh, teaching strategy. But we don't need to teach our students journaling, but we do need to teach them how to document their learning and save that. And we do a very poor job of that. Well, and to, to your point, the thing that I say every morning is not, uh, it is not un, like uh, random. Write down what you don't understand, what, when it comes up, because you will forget it in minutes. Like, you know, like, oh, I don't, oh, I don't quite understand why that doesn't work. Oh, I, doesn't, I don't quite understand why that doesn't work. That is like a little shelf for me that I'm constantly writing into, into a note. What I journal to Paul's thing is what I don't know. I journal that all the time. I just have this constant, what we call RFIs inside of Discord is my version of, I don't understand these things. And when I have extra time, I got 20 minutes before a meeting or whatever, I go through some of them, try to do some Googling and figure it out. Or I bring them up here or I bring them up you know, somewhere else and, I, and I, I, I pull those back in because I'm ready for them now that I know why I need them. Uh, Cara and then Chris and then we'll move on. Oh. You know, you can just use your mouse. Okay. All right. All right. So... Uh, one of my favorite things uh, that I use is called Loom. Um, and uh, to Alex's point um, around, around emails, like I don't send emails anymore. I record myself, put myself, you know, on the video with my little Loom and send anybody a response. And usually I'm sharing my screen because I'm typically answering a question of something of how to do mm -hmm. something. Um, and I just can't be bothered to, to email anymore or to write you know, paragraphs upon paragraphs of something, I'd much easier, you know, to just record a loom video and send it to somebody. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. <laughs> there we go. Wide shot. Somebody called okay. wide shot. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So my, my wife and I just uh, differ on this. So she's all about journaling because she did that when she was little as, as a way of nostalgia and to look back on things. And I'm, I'm with you, Alex, that she doesn't need to read any of that stuff. Um, but I tell the girls all the time, I said, if you got something to say, or you want to remember something, come in here, we'll turn the cameras on. You can, mm -hmm. you know, do like you're, somebody's interviewing you and we'll just save that. I mean, we just throw it on the FTP. You can watch it 20 years later. I love the fact that I took so many photos when I was a kid, I will say. Like that, that for me has been a huge thing, a huge thing of like, all. I took hundreds and hundreds of photos in high school and everything else because I had a camera. And so now everybody has one. I think that's interesting. Let's keep moving because we're, we're running pretty late and I have to go to work actually. <laughs> uh, Paul Wallace has the second to the last one before we get to the payoff of that very first thing we talked about today. Uh, Paul says, weaving together a virtual world video conferencing, slide sharing and social media in one experience. It's a meetup like conference well beyond other Zoom calls. It's called Gamer Jibe. Comments on the education applicability of this service or thing, Paul? I don't know what that is. Is, is that, is that, oh, you're tossing something? it back to me. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it, is it, uh, it, it's actually called that or is that, that, that it's in your head? Well, no, no, it's a, it's a virtual world that you walk through and you get up on stage and talk. It's very hard to learn. It took me a half an hour to figure it out, but they used it for a media tech. There's an outfit called media tech in Austin. They're mm -hmm. basically all the local startup entrepreneurs, all the Austin hotshots. They're all, Gung ho on this app now called Gamer Jive and uh, very difficult to use. But once you get the hang of it, <laughs> once like, you get the hang of that's it, that's not a good sell. <laughs> it's not a good sell. No, it, they. I told them, look, there's this, there's these guys doing this thing with Alex Lindsay that you need to look at because you need to do some. This is so difficult that you need some well, kind of pre-show to teach people how to use it and check their mics and check their video right. and do all the things we do and maybe it would be a better experience you know yeah i i think that uh i think again for me zoom osc was kind of a missing piece that we saw a couple of days you know a, a week ago or whatever um that that i hadn't i'd heard about it i just hadn't seen it but i feel like it's the missing piece of being able to create incredible events just with zoom you know, and tying it into all the hardware and software and everything else. Um, I think that it's, uh, but I think I, I'm, I didn't have a lot of interest in the event platforms before that. And then after I saw Zoom OSC, I lost all interest in anything other than just figuring out how to, you know, build something custom that sits on top of that. Um, so anyway, next question. And we're at the famous question that Jake Hamilton asked back around eight o'clock. Okay, educators. 
gift ideas to make streaming life easier for the virtual teachers in your family? What little, medium, or big things mm -hmm. do you think the teachers that you love would care about? Emily, first. Hands down, the Wacom board. Um, mm -hmm. Getting a Wacom board for the teachers that are teaching yep. virtually, uh, it's between like yep. 80 and $100 for the small one. And once you get the hang of that and you're you know, doing virtual classes and remote, and then you can use it when you go back in the class to write on your screen. Yeah. And if someone's really special, there you go. Get them the big one. Yeah, the expensive one. The yeah, <laughs> Anyone wants to send me one of those, I'll take it, but um, I can use the, the little pad. I have the little old bamboo one and it still yep. works. Yep, so. that's great. Uh, go ahead, uh, Tony. So mine are gonna be two apps, the Pro App Bundle for Education with mm -hmm. all of the Apple oh, yeah. uh, Pro software. And the 199 one, for basically everything, right? Forever. Yep, 199. And then the other one is Filmic Pro because yep. if they have a phone, they can turn their phone into a camera and it works with iPhones and Android. That's great. Fantastic. Bruce? Uh, I had a question. Would the Wacom tablet uh, be substitutable for by an iPad? Could that do what a tablet does? It's just a lot more expensive and doesn't really tie into your computer. So it's, I don't it's know. Antique. If it, well, the present, the, the present that I'd like to get and got finally for myself for Christmas was a was a Mac uh, M1, MacBook uh, Air M1. And, there you go. Uh, can't be better than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, uh, Steve, and then Bill, and then Chris. Oh, you're uh, you're much quieter than I expect. Sorry, thank you. Uh, uh, we talk about it all the time. I think uh, getting them a good microphone. You yeah. know, getting them into into the into the media with a good microphone and a good headset, so that they could listen to it, so they're not listening to the uh, speaker, uh, yeah. would be a really really wonderful thing. One thing that I found, and since I, I'm playing a little more keynote, uh, is is a little remote clicker, you know, so you don't have to be using the keyboard. You could just sit off to the side and just mm -hmm. uh, rotate through, uh, you know, the slides and go back and forth and back and forth with it. And, and these are relative, this is a Kensington and they're relatively inexpensive. Uh, yeah. And it, it's a nice little tool. It's also one of the reasons that I use, it's one of the main reasons I use uh, the little stream deck I use as my presentation tool um, because it, I can just put forward, back and everything else on it. And I don't have to think about my keyboard and I can just sit there and, and whack yeah. on it. Um, Bill, uh, and then uh, and then Chris, and then Roscoe. I was waiting for Roscoe. I was like, you better do this before the end of the day. All right, Bill, and then and then Chris. I'm going to go real cheap here. Um, for me, as, because I have to help with this, my mic mute switch is my favorite thing because I use it over and over again. And I would think that for any teacher, if you're going to use one of these less expensive things, I ha they have them for USB. They have them for 3.5 inch. It's just a one trick pony. I think you want something on your body where you know where it is, where you, if uh, you're in the middle of teaching and you've got to go to something else, just to mute your mic, mute your mic instantly and then come back uh, mm -hmm. unmute it later. That to me has been a huge help. Good. Chris Clark. And then Roscoe. I suggest a, a case of a nice wine from the Alexander Valley in California. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, go ahead, Roscoe. Uh, that was an earlier discussion on chat, where to get wine in Napa. Um, mine is very practical. Make sure that they have a backup drive. I can't tell you how much heart wrench when you put hours and hours and hours into something and then it's gone. Yep. There's only two hard drives in the whale, two, two hard drives that exist. Those that have failed and those that are about to. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Guy. Yeah. I like the Facebook portal for the fact that it up the, um, the meeting. So that mm -hmm. way, if you're holding up small text, it's just a nice thing to have. Oh, it looks nope, like look at that. There we go. His. Yep. So that'd be mine. And a ring light, of course. I wouldn't be me if I didn't say ring light, ring light, ring light. <laughs> you need a ring light, yeah. Uh, John. A timer. A little timer. Just have it wherever you, you need to time things, and I have it sitting right on the desk. 
Everything I think about timers and kids, all I think about is that my brothers would do anything if you timed them to do it. <laughs> so we would be like, I'll time you to go get me another Coke. You know, they'd, they'd run out, they'd run out. They go, how long it take? And I didn't know. I didn't, I'd look, I'd look at my watch as they came back in and said, oh, it was 28 seconds. And there was the, the positive reinforcement worked forever. Anyway, every time I think timers, my brother will be upset if we bring him on sometime. I, I was thinking of bringing my brother on, by the way, this is the, at the end of this. I don't know if people would be interested in a, in, a, in a third hour somewhere or a second hour. I don't know if it'd be a really good second hour of talking about how he, the, the reason I think it would be interesting is just to see how another business runs and he'd be interesting to talk to about it. There's a lot of people that run their businesses that don't, but he has, he runs our golf course and he's probably one of the most fascinating people to talk to about how he does it and how he thinks about it. Would people be interested in that? Is that something that am I just thinking? I'd, that I'd that be would interested be in hearing your brother talk about you. Oh my gosh. That's a dangerous thing. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I don't, okay. I think we're going to pull the whole thing back. You know, like, so, like I don't, <laughs> I don't think I that. so well, well, I'm going to try to talk to him because the winter is a time I can get him because the golf course isn't as busy. And so we might try to get him on a Saturday or something. If people want to, we'll just put it somewhere else and, and let him and bring him in. And just, if you want to talk about how a golf course runs, um, he's just extremely fun to listen to, but also very analytical at the same time. Go ahead, Chris. I'd like to bring on your sister, Jennifer, to talk oh, yeah. about how she runs her uh, photographer's yeah. um, interview right. blog. I don't know why I haven't brought them in as, as, as uh, second guests. I, I think that- I think maybe I could probably I could probably stack. To. Oh no, she would come on. I think I haven't asked them. I think that she's got a pretty good rig. I set her up pretty well. So she's got a pretty uh, good setup at her house. Um, uh, the, um, yeah. I don't want it to become the Lindsay show, but th th there are some fascinating uh, conversations and get my dad to come in and talk about law would be fun, you know, just because he's a lot of fun to talk to about that. He's trying to think about his podcast on that. And that's why. I and Lincoln. Or Grant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Grant. yeah, absolutely. Anyway, maybe some third, third things to entertain you guys with my, my crazy family um, at some point. I don't want to make it too uh, weird. So, but, but they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Lindsay Hollywood, uh, holiday special. Yeah, exactly. We could do a couple hours of it. Just, just to, with some for, awkward, ugly uh, sweaters. The, and they'll tell you, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you guys. I think we're just going to do it for our group. I don't think we're going to put it out for everyone. Uh, let me, let me look at the date here. I talked to, um, let's see. I am trying, is it Thursday? What could have been sparked by the words ugly sweaters? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking about Christmas. Um, and so the week of the 21st, and I don't know if we'll do it on the 24th because that's Thursday. It is Thursday and I got to talk, um, uh, talk to them, but yeah. So anyway, so we'll, we'll, um, I, I, we might have a special music guest. I think I told you we might do a concert that week. So we'll like, uh, it's only one song, but it's a, uh, it's a very Christmassy song. So we'll, we'll, uh, but my neighbor happens to have written a very, very popular Christmas song and, and he's really a lot of fun. And so I, I'm talking and because he can't travel usually every Christmas, literally for the last like 40 years, he's on tour for this one song. And so, so I said, well, why don't we just do a stream from your house? And he's totally down. So, so um, anyway, that that's coming up the week of the 21st. I don't, we'll see if it's the 24th makes sense for him. Uh, but if it does, we'll do it. Cause it'd be the perfect thing to have for a Thursday session. Um, so uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll work on that. Um, anyway, thank you all. Uh, the, you know, the, the secret to why I do the EDU on, on uh, Saturdays is because I rarely have to go jump straight to work and we can run heavy all, you know, cause it's, it's definitely my, my, you know, my favorite conversation. So uh, I really want to thank all the educators that come both in the attendees and, and especially in the panel. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Um, we're not finding all the answers yet, but at least we're starting to dig out some of the questions. And uh, it, I just think we have an incredibly all-star staff, uh, all-star panel here and all-star, you know, people that are here. Just, it's just really, it's a conversation I don't hear happening anywhere else where anything's okay to talk about, where we throw it in, we're brainstorming and we don't have all the answers. We're just trying to figure it out. I think it's pretty interesting. So thank you all for coming and um, we'll see you all. Some of you just next week, but a lot of you tomorrow. <laughs> so, so see you, see you later. All right. Have a great, have a great weekend.